right, let's make some memories here. Uh, uh, yeah. Welcome back to the Verdigree table, everybody, to another episode of D20 Questions, and a honor and a privilege to have Lucas, the illustrious Kelf's Corner, Kelf, out of Hello. the corner, into the dungeon. Welcome, man. I'm glad, I'm happy to have you here. It's always a pleasure That's to be talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I very much appreciate you having me here. It is good to get out of the tavern sometimes and get into the dungeon. Uh, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's nice to get back to the tavern from the dungeon, yeah. too. <laughs> but it's a, life is about cycles. It's about coming and going. And It's true. Um, so, yeah, you you may know Lucas from Kelf's Corner, his uh, Twitch live stream talk show i mean i catch up a lot of like what's new and exciting in the world of D, &D um now that it's new and exciting again and not new and controversial <laughs> yes uh you do a good job of shining spotlights on like new products but also like whatever D, D beyond features what i feel like i learn a lot every time i watch you and that's only the first whatever quarter to a third uh and then most of the time you're cooking up your own homebrew stuff um and that's personally my favorite part of what you do. Subclasses, I think, are probably your favorite. <laughs> so subclasses are subclasses are my favorite. I, I think I think subclass homebrewing subclasses speaks a lot into the like main design of a character nowadays in Five E, mm. since that's like the defining feature. So mm -hmm. coming up with cool subclasses is definitely a lot of fun. And I think you do a very good job of like focusing on balance to the point of like you're taking input, like you're you're it's not quite play testing. I'm sure you play you play test as well, but you get ideas and influence from a ton of different people. You you put yourself out there in the process, which for me is intimidating. I mean, I've been, I've done a little bit of it lately, but like I like to be like, okay, this is finished and done. Like the compendium is the first time I'm like, I haven't even proofread this yet. Cause like I need, I'm like, like excited, I need you to have it. But you you're very open with your process and very transparent and like balance oriented, which I really like because I feel like a lot of people are trying to make the most powerful thing. Yeah, ever, <laughs> which is yeah. As a game master, I hate. Yeah, um, no, no, definitely that, and that's that is a big factor in it is uh, because I I'm a power gamer at heart. I'm an optimizer, and uh, having being a play being that is a mindset for a player but also being the forever dm in three three current campaigns i am constantly in that dichotomy of i want this to be as cool and flashy and powerful as i can and then that dm part of me goes but imagine it at your own table mm -hmm. imagine somebody rolling up to your table with it and yeah it's it's about it's about not being afraid of hearing the critiques and uh casting the widest net because uh aside from like my own community and posting it in like your discord um the various other homebrew discords out there uh like cinderblock sally or mm -hmm. uh you know the discord of many things critical crafting uh just to name a few like throwing them out on reddit just to get anonymous people looking at it because you'll look at it one way as you're designing it, but then you'll have somebody random who's like, but if you do this, if you take this one item in this one feed and you do this, suddenly they can touch someone and they explode. And <laughs> okay, yeah, didn't think of it that way, but you know, okay, point taken. There is a, uh, there's a, there's a phase of game design and I don't think you can start there because it makes you scared of making cool stuff. And you do want, you don't want to make a weak subclass because no one will ever play it. And I think mm. from the from the dungeon master perspective, I'm not afraid of somebody being too powerful at my table because the dungeon master has every tool in the total table. control. I, yep. I can I can counterbalance anything that's happening on this side of the table. What I can't do is balance what's happening on the other side of the screen between the players. Yes. And the problem with unbalanced subclasses, homebrew, because of this 5e, there's there's official things that are low-key band at my table because if one player has way too much power compared to another player a lot of the time that's going to create an imbalance that people are going to feel and yeah. it's going to change the fun and the tone and it's it's not about like oh you're going to spoil my perfect dungeon it's like don't worry about that i got that covered yep. it's between the players where the balance matters and i think a lot of people lose sight of that yeah no and, and that is that is very true because um 
it, that's that's something that I have caught myself in the process of doing it where I have made features or I've made uh, like feats themselves where it pulls stuff from other subclasses or it pulls stuff from other classes. And that was a big learning point of mine when I was uh, trying to get community feedback with somebody who was pointing out. It's like, if you're giving them this, but somebody is playing, you know, if you're giving a monk, you know, something that the wizard can do uh, because you think the monk is underpowered, why would somebody want to play a wizard at that point? You know, or if uh, I think I, I was just reviewing uh, a bit of homebrew recently where uh, it was a sorcerer who functioned like a wizard. And uh, there was a point that was brought up was um, how how do you justify wanting to play a wizard at that point when this sorcerer gets the best of both worlds? So it's about making sure that nobody's stepping on toes. Yeah. And some of that's in in there to start someone that's in the bones mm -hmm. of 5e and you don't have as much there's a lot of bleed yeah happening between and i want everybody to feel distinct mm -hmm. um but again what, what i was saying is there's a, there's a point in game design where you have to go back in after you've done the coolest thing ever and asshole proof it <laughs> that's, oh, a, yeah. that's a technical <laughs> term whereas yeah. someone's gonna because like you 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 have to zoom out and see okay how is this all going to interact if i do take this magic item and this feat can yeah. i break the game and that's some yeah. people's that's many people's goal yeah um why are you I trying have, to I, break I the have, game guys but <laughs> yeah i have i've i've uh a close group of friends um, that whenever I make homebrew, they're the ones that get it fairly early on mm. uh, because we go and sit down for, you know, 10, 20 minutes and we theory craft on how can we break this? Like, mm -hmm. like what are mm -hmm. what are the limits of this stuff? And uh, I, I have a great appreciation for their minds and how they see stuff because there are things that they come up with that I never would have even considered and things that I forget just overall. There's a lot of stuff. Nobody knows mm -hmm. everything. Nobody yeah. knows it all. And when one, if anybody figures it out, give it a month and they change it. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> very true. Um, the but the other reason, I mean, I like all of your stuff and subclasses just shine because that seems to be your favorite. But magic yeah. items and spells, um, even like character backgrounds and races or species or lineages or whatever we end up calling them um, you you have both sides of the equation. You have thought about how this is going to interact with the other pieces of the game and the other people at the table but you are also very much focused on the flavor and the tone and it's not just like this thing make big number good it's like this is a vibe this is very yeah. much on th theme this is uh one i think you have a very good uh d descriptive language and that's some people don't like that but like you can always skip those introductory paragraphs you can't exactly. put them in there right like right um and yeah i think you you open with that and like here here is the it's conceptual here is the narrative concept this is what it's going to feel mm -hmm. like to be this kind of person this kind yeah. of power and yeah love that love that yeah yeah no and i appreciate that because that's that is a that is a big point that uh i think gets i, th I think in some subclasses can get lost but i mean that's that's the entire idea of a subclass you know it's this a, a, like playing a wizard cool that's that's a grand scale thing but playing an evoker <clears throat> that has a very specific tone with it playing a diviner has a specific tone um and that's that is something that the subclass should be a part of your character's backstory as much as possible it's one of the big reasons why i have for a long time thought that um you know sorcerers yeah and clerics they get their uh, they get their stuff at first level because this is who they are and this is what their faith is. But I, I have believed for a long time paladins should have mm. their sacred oath at first level because mm. that's what makes you a paladin. You, you've taken this oath to be this particular brand and your subclass should be a defining trait about yourself and it should have just as much impact on your role play as your lineage or your background or your, you know, 30 page backstory about why you're an Azamar warlock cleric. <laughs> a thousand percent. I can understand the mechanical reason why, like, 
I like level one, level two. Like a lot of people start mm-hmm. at three. I like a slow progression. Uh, one, I think, because I love bringing new people in. So I, I will yeah. always have a brand new, you know, baby D&D player at my table. So I like, I like. okay, first you learn what a D20 is, and then we'll talk about sneak yeah. attack and whatever else. Yep. Um, but especially with the pace of most fifth edition campaigns where it's not, I'm not making you take a month of downtime and a training montage to get your subclass. It's like you went to sleep level two, you woke up level three. Yeah. And now it's totally different. Like, yeah, a lot, a lot of the core of that, the the subclass is the defining part of the character a lot of the Mm -hmm. time. And if it's not, it's not a great subclass. And I think you, you put that front and center in your design. Um, so what uh, th- I agree with you. <laughs> Good <Yeah>. job. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's it's definitely one of those things that uh you you want to you you want it to be something that gets somebody excited. Cuz honestly to me I have I have designed more characters and have built more backstories based on a cool subclass that I've seen mm-hmm. than anything else. Mm-hmm. You know, I I will I, I I there's one that comes to mind uh that was called the Squire. And it was, it's a fighter who kind of binds themselves to one other player in the group and they get benefits so long as they're helping them. And uh, Mm. my style of play is support. When I saw this, I immediately started to think about a character who was like, uh, you know, in charge of somebody in the party as like their appointed warden and all their job is, is to protect them and to make sure that they see it through to the end. Uh, and it's stuff like that where just even even just like the concept of a subclass can inspire an entire design. Yeah, so and yeah. the line gets the line gets blurry, right? Like that could be a class too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, like, totally, totally. And you, yeah, because we get caught up on the minutia. I think because it's it's a nerd culture, and it is it is mathy, and it does matter for the rules, mm-hmm. and there's a very deep structure to everything. But like, you could get a spell. Or a magic item, or a subclass oh, yeah. feature, and they're all going to do, they're all potentially doing the same thing, right? Like mm-hmm. a feat is a subclass feature, more or less, most yep. of the time. Like, so, yeah, subclass just seems to be like the the base code, right? The heart of the thing. No one, no, no one can take away. The, you can lose the magic item or burn through your spell slots, and I guess you can use up all your subclass abilities, but that's the core of you. It's not something you found yep. or you learned. It's something that you developed within yourself. Yeah. Um, so I understand why that's your your sweetheart. Yeah, that's it. it's that's it. It's it's the core to me. It's the core of the character, and that's funny enough. That's actually why uh, a big thing for me playing Pathfinder because I play in a Pathfinder mm-hmm. two game. Um, they don't really have subclasses, and the identity of the character in that system is more built off of uh, like these essentially kind of like you said picking a feat mm-hmm. and designing them yourself um and it's something that i've actually struggled with a lot over there because mm. i i prefer having that semblance of structure where when i'm playing a bard and i say okay i'm going to play a glamour bard now i know like okay glamour bards are the idols of the world they're the ones that draw the attention they put on the biggest show they captivate an audience they're this, you know, this image of of beauty and spectacle. So I know what I'm playing. Mm-hmm. Whereas with uh, my other character, uh, who I'm playing in Pathfinder, he's a little hug person bard named Bo after my dog. Um, <laughs> forgot about that. Yes, I love. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that concept. I, I was forgot. doing. We talked about. I was that doing his time. journal entries for a while, and I I stopped because I I lost track of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know he he's a very skittish kind of dog who uh kind of he kind of like falls back into the cracks. But then um when somebody walks into our house, he's he's right up in their face when they're trying to leave, and he's barking at them like he's some big dog, like saying like yeah get out of my house. And so that's. That's how I've built Bo, but like I look at all these features and I'm like, I'm like, I don't know exactly how he wants to be or like how I want to do this. And he has be- he has evolved to become his own thing. Uh he's he's actually into uh psionics and ghost hunting. Mm. Um that's mm. his big thing, is uh he he fought some ghosts and he wants to uh psychically like combat ghosts at this point. So um he's still a coward hundred percent and uh 
he does everything he can now to uh, make his enemies feel the same fear that he does. Oh, interesting. See, I, I'm I'm partial to that, like, emergent. It's rare that I'll come into a campaign with a fully developed character concept because mm, I okay. want to see who's around and where, yep. like, where you can fit. Um, circling back to the Pathfinder conversation for a sec, the, uh, it lets you... It's the perfect fit for some people. It's a, I, I, we, I ran a couple camp, Pathfinder campaigns this year and really enjoyed it. Pathfinder 2E, I should say, mm -hmm. pre-revision. Pre um, really enjoyed it, but there is definitely analysis paralysis can kick in. There's a ton of decision points, which is the perfect fit for some people. Um, yeah. And they do have, I will argue that they do have the equivalent of subclasses in the sense that they have some... I don't know what the title is in the book, but when you go to a, each class's page, it's like here's um, here's the Mad Bomber Alchemist, and it tells you which oh. feats to pick. So it's kind of there for you if you don't want to make all the choices. But if you're the kind yeah. of person who is open to the Pathfinder Two ebook, you're going to keep flipping to look at every feat that's option that's yep. open to you, and it's a lot. So I think it's a good lesson in how limits actually free you up and lead to more imaginative things than you can do anything you can be anything it's it's way better to focus and be like eliminate a bunch of things first and then start down that path yeah. at least for my creative process um all right, I should say, I links have been down there the whole time, but they'll be up over there as well to uh, Twitch uh, specifically. Um, but that also ends up on YouTube uh, in the aftermath. And check out Kel's Corner, uh, the Discord, where you see behind the scenes of all, all, the, all the donuts getting made. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, definitely, I definitely try to keep those updated as much as possible because um getting getting feedback all the time is just a uh a better option than not getting any feedback at all yeah i am i admire that i try to do the same thing but you are uh you're inspirational you're very good at it thank you sir. um all right speaking of creative limits let's roll some dice yes that is what we do here that is what we do here let's pull some questions and roll some dice uh for the first for the first half i'm going to ask you to roll uh, on the screen, so everybody can see your results for the yeah. the back end. We're gonna roll real dice. Okay, awesome. All right, what would you like me to roll, sir? Roll twenty. A d twenty, please and thank you. All right. Seven that is a seven. Big number seven. All right. So we are looking for other inspirational sources for ttrpgs that you pull from so not necessarily a campaign or a game but um anything else that you draw inspiration from your character design or your subclass design or your uh whatever campaign you run i know you have many oh, plate spinning <laughs> yeah um uh honestly i mean when it comes to when it comes to campaign inspiration um i'm actually uh, Honestly, with that, I've most of my campaigns are based on uh, the gods are trying to fight the world. Um, so I guess I guess the 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 more like unusual sources of where I've gathered some inspiration, honestly, uh, it would be with my character designs um, and just making them more based on uh, random Internet memes. Um, okay. or, uh, even, uh, even like a, a character I made, his name's, um, Winston Mills, uh, general, uh, oh. Winston Mills. And don't you uh, forget was, it. Yeah. He was based on, uh, he was based on a cereal box. Cause one day my buddy and I were working and I saw general Mills and I said, that's the name of a character. And I made him, um, and became one of my favorite characters. He's a, uh, he's an eldritch knight who's, uh, used to be a paladin was, uh, cursed with undeath and now he's trying to get his life back in order um but yeah strange internet memes is is in in essence the bread and butter for me uh one of my mo one of my more popular subclasses uh that i made was a warlock who made a contract with planet fitness i was hoping and 
That it's yeah. written down, but I figured it was going to come up. <laughs> yeah, the Jim, the Jimbro Warlock, uh, one of my one of my more popular ones, um, was was birthed out of a video I saw online where it was it was a devil working at the counter of Planet Fitness and having people sign a contract, and I'm like, that would be a really cool character, like, uh, you know, a melee strength and charisma based. Uh, warlock whose main goal is to get is to get strong to get yoked and to encourage people to sign up so that planet fitness can keep going that was uh yeah so so that's i think i think just like random things on the internet where you you'll get that you'll get that spark of of inspiration or just a joke of when, when i'm after i made general mills um my buddy made a comment about making Captain Crunch a character. Mm -hmm. So uh I, I made a uh I made a bugbear who was uh a sea captain and he, he was a uh he was a beast barbarian and his big thing was that when he would get into fights he would use it to like expand his jaws out and he would crunch people. So it's mm -hmm. like it's like yeah two of my characters just named after cereal mascots and cereal brands. So What's next? Count Count Chocula or Oh, oh you know what? Okay, I mean Tony the on. Tony the Tiger would be a monk. Like well, we could do we could do this Tony, for the rest of the hour and a half we have. Tony, like, say, <laughs> uh what what's that what's that one um what's that one tiger race of people that's Rakshasa? Ooh, uh you could you could have yeah. Tony you could have like Tony the Rakshasa. Got, I obviously can't I can't I was about to try to make my hands be backwards somehow. I don't know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I can't I don't know what I was gonna do there, but uh, <laughs> Have, yeah, have uh, have have Tony the Rock Shasa. Um, yeah, no. Funny enough, in my Fandolin Five campaign, uh, my players are going to be going on a one shot right now. We're going to be moving into a cluster of one shots to let the players explore explore around and just kind of do what they want to do for a while. Um, and one of the ones they're doing is they have to go to an underwater enclave of vampires because mm -hmm. uh, one of uh, again internet meme. Somebody said vampires don't have to don't have to breathe. So why couldn't they just be underwater? No sun um, down there. Yeah, no sun down there. It's super dark, uh, super cold. And another thing that I saw on the internet one day was of a diving bell spider. And if you've never seen a diving bell spider, it it's it's just a spider, but it has tiny little hairs on its body, and it'll go into water and it'll make a bubble of air and it'll make its nests underwater. So my theory is there is an enclave of vampires that rides around on underwater spiders that my players have to go and deal with in order to get some things. And you know what? Maybe down there they have they have one that's uh really into chocolate. So uh, mm. that might be that might be the one who they have to fight off against mm. is Count Chocula. Mm. I love this. Uh, Fandolin Five players, if you are watching this, spoiler mm. alert. Yeah, spoiler. Yeah, yeah. Retroactively, <laughs> um, this will come out for a little bit. So hopefully, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> they will yeah. have confronted that. Think, I, thinking of the timing, it'll probably it, they'll, they'll probably they'll probably be close to that. I, I spent so long gushing about your uh, your subclass creation that we didn't really talk about Fandolin Five. But you just said you draw a lot of your campaigns are like. You, the gods are doing stuff um yeah. and i i had the pleasure of uh, participating in a trivia uh, oh, yes. uh a, a chaotic trivia <laughs> experience what uh, a fun day it, it instantly went off the rails but uh bob world builder and uh grace mm -hmm. world destroyer ran uh ran a uh a panel at a convention that we were both lucky enough to attend and your I mean, I don't know if it just is Forgotten Lores. It was, it was most of the questions were uh, Forgotten Realms. I don't know yeah. if that extends to like Greyhawk and all the other, but like you have a deep understanding of the lore. And for me, it's the Pantheon stuff is always the inter the most interesting stuff. I always warn people against getting sucked into it because mm. it's like the thing that the, the dungeon masters guy tells you to start with and like yeah. your players are not going to contact that stuff for, for a year or two if you're right. successfully running a campaign so i don't think it's where you start but oh boy is it good and like you yeah. need one or two gods can drive the whole freaking campaign because it's thematic it's yeah a lot of a lot of cool influences so that i i admire your encyclopedic knowledge of the at least the forgotten realms canon. yeah uh so so that's the thing um a, a big thing about me is that um, 
I, I, I grew up, I grew up in a Catholic household, but I'm a professed atheist. And the thing is, is that I, I have adored studying and learning about theology. I've taken courses on it uh, in college. I've just, I, I love reading about different theological I ideologies. And when I got into D&D, &D, that was a huge factor mm. in setting up what I, you know, a lot of the characters that I made in um the various pantheons just astounded me mm -hmm. um and and funny enough i i have an entire folder um on my computer of just gray hockey and gods okay. um yeah, i because think... yeah because uh the second the second full campaign that i ran was in the gray hawk setting and all of my characters uh, all my players were associated with one god or another and their whole thing was that they were trying to stop the cult of Therizden from bringing the mad god back. So yeah, uh, the 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 religion, the the gods, the theology in D and D is is such a huge factor in a lot of the campaigns that I run. That yeah, um, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden is obviously fighting against Arl, god of uh, beauty and ice. Uh, Fanlin Five, the party is going against the cult of dragon, and you know the mother of dragons. And uh, I even, I even got their their biggest ally right here. I got a mm. Bahamut's uh, pop figure, um, and even the the private game that I run uh, at my local library. Um, that one, the group is fighting against a cult that does not want to bring their god to the world, uh, but they are working against a cult that worships the god mask mm. so that was uh that was a fun one getting to play with shadows and uh you know nightmares and stuff mm -hmm. very eldritch horror campaign yeah like i'm in the midst of uh we're getting to like the good stuff in um in shattered obelisk now and i'm oh yes, yes. making it better but <laughs> such uh, a good setting such a good setting it's it's good i can I, there's a lot of criticism about it and i understand it and it's like this is the the year to bash everything Hasbro and like mm -hmm. I'm not I blame no one for doing that. Um I think it's I th I think it's good. I don't think it's the best thing they've ever done. I think it's I think it's good and I think it has a bad rap. And eventually I might start making videos. I like I need to I need to play a thing before I really talk about it in right. an educational way. I just whatever my own limitations. <laughs> yeah, that's understandable. But um also, I'm curious, and this is going to be a complete tangent, so we'll, I'll, I won't dive too deep. But Joseph Campbell is behind me on this shelf somewhere. I think these are the Joseph Campbells. Do you are you familiar with? Uh, uh I'm not. Joseph Campbell for ev everybody, wherever you fall on the re religious spectrum, like Joseph Campbell is the reason Star Wars happened. Okay. Oh. Um, Joseph Campbell was uh a he was anthropology comparative religion and he came up with the idea of the monomyth the hero's journey oh, okay kind of and it's like carl jung if you want to get deep into it was a big inspiration for him uh in the compendium i, I talk about character archetypes that's like mm -hmm. speaks to me uh i don't know if i would say i'm a jungian but whatever i like the idea of archetypes um joseph campbell kind of saw through the matrix and was like oh people make myths the way they make saliva right <laughs> like it's yeah. just a thing that our brains secrete and everybody well a lot of these things that seem so different on the surface are actually the same substructures being expressed in different times and cultural contexts and places so it's fascinating you start to like see all the connections and it really especially if you've had i had a similar experience like we i was raised half-assed catholic which i think most catholics are all right <laughs> uh and like fell out of that and it joseph campbell helped me like appreciate it the way i appreciated you know buddhism or hinduism that i yeah. approached as an adult whatever that's a that's a different podcast that's I'm a different gonna, episode. i'll say I'm, I'm gonna i i, I haven't pulled up i know about the hero's journey uh hmm. i I've, I've watched a lot of uh a lot of like videos about it talking about how so many stories can like you know really play into it even whenever it doesn't seem like it uh but yeah i'm gonna have to look into him a little more after it's this. also it's great it's great for adventure design right i fall into that a lot like what beat of the story are we on it's um like and like it's just fun to watch people like show you how like happy gilmore is the hero's journey 100 percent, right like it's just good yeah. storytelling 
um, good adventure design. So even if like you're not interested in world religion and mythology and that side of things, if you're you're writing adventures, you're making campaigns. And if you're not super literary, you don't, because it is, um, it can be dry and dense a little bit. There's this awesome series from PBS from like the late eighties, early nineties. He sits down with Bill Moyers. Um, and I'm sure you can find it on the internet, hopefully legally. <laughs> um, but Bill Moyers and Joseph Campbell, I forget what the name of that series is, but that's a great like mini series and like woo, hmm. inspiration is everywhere. But it's a guy like you, but it's, I think most people watching this would uh, would g gain a lot of benefit from that. I think Joseph Campbell. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it is available on uh, Prime Video. Amazing. So uh, Joseph Campbell and the Power of the Myth. The power of myth. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, let's roll some more dice before I dive deeper into yeah. tangents here. Ba -da -da -da. Uh, give me another D20, please. All right. Eleven. Eleven. Seven Eleven. Not bad. Yeah. What Every... a great store. The most common player or game master mistake. And I'll settle for a common if you don't have like the most common handy. But what do you think is a common mistake out there that people people need to recognize as a mistake? Um, a play uh, the most uh, a common a common player mistake, um, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is uh, and I I've harped on this at various tables that I've played at. Um, I've seen various videos. Just know what your character can do. Like, <laughs> like know, knowing knowing what your character can do, and and I I don't I don't want to say that it's it's necessarily uh, uh to say that it's a mistake, um but like like players players out there to the world, do your DM a favor, fifteen minutes before your game, read your character sheet, mm -hmm. look at what your spells do, look what your class features are, look what your racial traits are, uh if you can summon creatures, kind of generally know. What creatures you can summon? Um, if if you have a bunch of actions uh, that that can happen on your turn, followed by a bunch of bonus actions, maybe maybe understand what each one of them does and how they how they kind of work together. And um, also read your inventory sheets. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you're on D and D Beyond, there's a button. Just click that. Read your <laughs> read what items you have. You'll be surprised of of the amount of times I as we are playing D and D. And at one of my tables, I have, uh, even when I'm playing in person, I take my laptop with me and I have everyone's D&D Beyond character sheet pulled up. The amount of times that I will scour their inventory when they are playing for reasonable items that might help them in a situation, the amount of times that I've had players go, oh, I forgot I had that, is, is just mind-boggling to me. I... Um, I admire that. I don't, I don't know. I, I would like to believe it's a healthy boundary I've set, <laughs> or maybe I'm just not as a good of a dungeon master as you are, but I, your inventory is yours. I tell people that all the time. Oh, hey, what yeah. did we get? I'll go back and look like I'm not a jerk, mm -hmm. but like who you need to know who, what you have and who has what as well. And in the heart of combat, I'm going to hold you to it. If it's in the bag of holding, it's an action to get it. Yeah. Um, but man, People forget what they have, and it's natural. It's not, I'm not mm -hmm. like saying that's a bad thing, but like there's stuff in your inventory that you forgot about, and it's like finding a treasure chest all over again. <laughs> and um, but yeah. yeah, that 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 spoke to my heart. Players can prep. Players should prep. What mm -hmm. I do lately, Dungeon Master hack. Actually, when we were learning Pathfinder Second Edition, this it's crunchy as hell. We were doing a crash course. We like I didn't. I picked. I bought the book and we started playing like two days later. So I'm like, I'm learning the Dungeon Master side. You need to know your character, and in the process of doing that, you are teaching me what your stuff does. So now, yes. I do, even, even if I know half the time, I will say I will ask someone to like, oh, read that. Like, explain that to me. Read that to me. Mm -hmm. So that they are internalizing the thing. Because if I just say, oh, this does that and this does that and this does that. Yes. It's the GPS telling you how to go and you never actually learn how to drive your car to that destination. Whereas like, yep. I'm not if I don't have to, your, your dungeon master only has so much processing power in their brain. If they are using it to adjudicate and referee and explain the rules, then that's okay. So, and like, if you're a new player, whatever, again, I love new players. I'm always encouraging new players to come and learn. And I, I'm a 
a very educational dungeon master and whatever youtuber mm -hmm. um however if i don't have to do that as much i can do the other cooler stuff that a video right. game system or a computer can't do and we can get out of the you know i'm comfortable with metagaming i think more than some people because i do like the strategy side and i do run a very educational table and oh yeah like, um learn um but man if we don't have to if we don't have to do that that's just it's not like the game time is shorter it's that it's more full of story and narrative yeah. beats character development and yeah if you can if you know what your this spell does mm -hmm. and you have that down pat now you can come up with cool ways to use it look for other situations right. to apply it come up with just like different ways to describe the same thing so you're not just i pushed the button that i've pushed a hundred times before yeah players yeah players. no yeah no, and that's and that's it it's 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 just about it's about keeping things it's about keeping things smooth and fluid and and much like yourself i have uh i've actually gone online before and hosted just open games for people who've never played D D, who just mm. want to get a flavor of it i have like a very simple encounter that i run um and it's one of those things where when you have the expectation of, hey, these players don't know what their abilities are, then yeah, you are in a learning mode. You're going to take it slower. But when you've been playing for, you know, two, three years and your, you know, your go-to spell is still something that you want, you, you know, you have to ask, how does this work? Um, you know, it, it just, like I said, 10, 20 minutes before the game, read your character sheet. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's what I do with my Pathfinder game. Uh, I also play in a Marvel superhero game, uh, every other week. And that's generally what I do about 15 minutes before the game is I read over all the things that I can do this way. When we get into combat, I have a general sense of what that is. Mm -hmm. um, in the, in the unlikely event that I play a character, I take, I take notes cause like, especially D and D beyond, but even on your character sheet, like the, the, mm -hmm. There's something buried in your your racial traits that you forgot you have. Oh yeah, straight up. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I take I I on the back of the character sheet I give myself bullet points of the th like this is what you should remember when you're like and I'll I'll do like columns like the pillars of play like this is this is mm -hmm. stuff that I could use in social situations this is stuff I can use in exploration this is this is yep. combat and like this is my spell DC this is my spell save DC this is my to hit this is the damage for this spell like I make it so that it's I spend instead of spending five minutes, I spent fifteen minutes so that I don't have to spend those ten minutes every right. time. <laughs> like yeah, so yeah, this way you're making it you're you're setting yourself up for success. And everybody's built differently. Mm -hmm. Um so like I don't know what's the best way for you to internalize information, but for me, having it in a different format that I've created for myself and physically writing words on a paper etches mm -hmm. them into my brain deeper too. And I know not yeah. everybody's like that, but a lot of people might be surprised to learn that they're like that if they try it. See, funny enough for me, um, it's and and actually, uh, somebody that we both know, um, Stacy has brought up in the past about having, uh, character sheets that are color coded. Mm. That was uh, that was something that that was brought up at one point, and I mean that's that's a good idea for people that you know whether whether you are more acclimated to like associating certain actions with certain colors, um, or and and I have I have mentioned this before, um with different uh with different people over the years with D, D beyond if you could have instead of the preset panels that they offer if you could move those panels around and mm. have more screen real estate mm. for stuff that you want access to mm. kind of like a player dm screen you know like like if if there were certain spells that i use all the time let me have like a little check let me have a little list you know, on the side, very similar to how you want to flip your page over on the back and have those quick things. Mm -hmm. I wish that those were, I wish that those were a little more accessible um, at, at a fast break. So. Um, and yes, as, uh, I like Stacy's idea. In her case, everything would be purple, but uh, yeah, that's very true. That's yeah, what, 100%. Uh, shout out, shout out <laughs> to uh, Stacy of the Fandalid five. Um, but uh, the, the highlighters, that's, I mean, yeah. I, I I used to do that a lot in back in college. I used to use highlighters a lot. Now I, I don't as maybe because I don't have any handy. 
Um, but yeah, man, high, uh, green for healing and red for damage and yeah. whatever, man. Yellow for for more like contextual social situations, like mm -hmm. especially if you're a spellcaster, know your stuff and yeah. there's stuff you forgot. Like it's not just like make your dungeon master's life easier. That's part of it, and that's what I'm lamenting about. <laughs> that's where mm -hmm. my angst is coming from. But there's you're you're leaving stuff on the table. You're leaving your yeah. you're leaving opportunities for yourself for, for your characters to do cooler stuff. More. Oh yeah. Time. And and I, I I forget exactly who it was. It was uh it was on a dungeon or a dimension twenty video uh, or a short. It might have been Emily Axford, um or Shabon Thompson, but they had they had a book. Uh, they had like a little notebook that in it they wrote down every action, bonus action, and reaction interaction that they could ever have for their character. Mm -hmm. So they had like. If I want to do, if my first action is attacking with my sword, this is everything that I can do after that. And if I, if my first action is this, this is everything I can do after. And they basically just made like a little flow chart that they can say, okay, this is the path that I'm going to take. And it, I can see that helping people. That takes a lot of time to set up. Um, but having a flow chart based on your actions and bonus actions and reaction interactions mm. could make it a lot easier for people to remember what they have and you know what they can do in combat or even in any social or uh, any encounter type 100 percent. i always tell people like uh, next to this one especially like new people but like mm -hmm. all right put a b and circle it next to this one because this is the bonus action and you're going to want to remember that yep. a month from now when you forget me saying this um, I will say on my side, again, for characters, which I don't get to play too often, but for like complex monsters, not every, not every monster that I prep, but you're run, you're running a spell caster, right. With a, like a legit yeah. spell book or, um, whatever, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> I'm always like driving home and like, ah, I forgot the thing, whatever you yeah. know, <laughs> the one monster ability. Cause you're, cause you're managing everybody else's stuff sometimes. Yep. But, um, I have like plays. Right, like there's with the monster, I got three, four rounds. But your typical combat on the player side, it's gonna be three to five rounds if it's oh, a, if it's an epic battle. But like, what's your opener? What's your closer? What's the thing yep. in the middle? You know, and then like one, what's your audible? <laughs> you know, that's all yeah. you need. And you know, you want again, you just want your character to be cooler. Figure out what abilities synergize. Figure out how to build combos for yourself. Yeah next level start to figure out what works with other that's that's when the party starts clicking i run darkness and you have blind sight and you can the, the druid wild shapes into a snake that has blind sight and yep. what like all right i can magic missile always hits if i can see him so i'm gonna do that before you do this and like whatever um combos are king yeah and you don't you don't see a ton of them out there I, I'll tell you what, I just ran a necromancer uh, in my private game, and I, I had that moment where I was prepping him the night before, and it's one of those ones where, uh, and I had I had somebody point this out to me, it was, uh, it was, it was, who, who was I forget what video it was, um, but there I was, it might have been Matt Coville, um, and in his video, he said, if you ever see a, if you ever see a wizard stat block or a mage stat block, that whole list of spells cut it down like you said to like two or three mm -hmm. because you're not going to use all of them there's never going to be a chance in hell that you're going to have you know 12 turns in combat if your players are if, if your players could even survive that long um but cut it down to two or three and mm -hmm. make sure that the ones that you choose are going to be the most logical thing to that that character is going to do. And I did that with a necromancer recently. Uh, players were in a dungeon. They were under uh, under this giant mound. And then the necromancer went up and his his three spells was web, fireball, and raise dead. Because with this character, he was going to shoot a web, lock everyone in, set them on fire, and whoever died, he was going to raise them. And that was it. That, that mm -hmm. was that was all I had prepared for him. Mm -hmm. And if I needed to, I, you know, luckily with my uh, with the reference site that I use, I could search up any necromancer spell and, you know, quickly look up blight or, you know, death touch if I need to. But 
you know, it's it's cutting it down to something that's far more manageable is is a lot easier in the long run. Right. He's not casting prestidigitation. You don't right. need yeah. that He's in not, front of yeah. you. You don't need, yeah, just clean it up. Yeah. yeah. So if I'm in a rush, I'll actually, instead of like making my own, I will just like reduce the one that's there. I've literally yeah. like copied and pasted into like a Word document and then deleted everything I don't need. So mm -hmm. you have it at your hands when it's when you're running. And you know what? And, and it's funny because, you know, when, when you pose this question about like a, a common uh, DM mistake mm. that that was one of the things that came to mind was um, when you are prepping a character, when you're prepping an NPC or a monster, you don't need their whole stat block. Mm. Let's be honest, especially mm -hmm. if if you're like me and you use a VTT and you have to import all that maybe by hand, you don't need to know that that character has proficiency in deception. Mm -hmm. Like you, you don't, you don't need that. Look, I mean, you know, it's, and, and there's a, uh, there's a really good uh, collection of adventures that I have recently been pulling from um, called mini dungeon tome by adventure a week. And mm -hmm. one of the cool things about their book is at the very end of everything, there is an entire catalog of stat blocks that are designed in such a way that it is essentially a little blurb that gives the briefest description about how each monster interacts and like the things that they can do and it has become how i prep uh mm -hmm. my my characters because instead of going in and entering all this data i just essentially copy and paste like what's their ac what's their hit points what's there to hit do i really need to worry about anything else you know and the uh, answer i mean i guess it depends what tier of play you're at but i would say roughly half the time the answer is no <laughs> yeah. And, and beyond that, it's and beyond that. It's like if I need to know any of their ability scores, I mostly need to know their uh, their mental ones, because half the time it's I need to know an intelligence, wisdom or charisma save and maybe a con save. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But actually, guess, dex yeah, dexterity. I guess it depends how you run your the, the social side of play, I guess. But like it's. Mm. Uh, yeah, I guess making uh, have, the players will make insight checks. I guess they have to know deception, but like it's so. I don't know. Yeah, and I don't definitely. I don't like those skills as much. And like the longer yeah. I'm here, the less I want. I want. I, I mean, I don't know. it's it's it's, it's rare. Based, but... I de I definitely have some players that are more focused on uh, wanting wanting insight roles. Um, and it's you know it's that's one of those things where it's like okay, cool. I I will judge this character. I will I will guesstimate what their charisma score might be, or I'll just do uh I'll just do what I've done in the past. I'll roll a D4 and that will be their bonus. And I'll flip a coin real fast. And if it's heads, they get a plus. If it's tails, they get a minus. So it's <laughs> like, okay, cool. Minus two to their minus two to their uh charisma. Cool. They get a minus two to this. So, you know, it's it's simple to roll with the D20 that you're rolling. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, we're gonna count we're gonna count that as a few answers because you hit you hit both sides of that coin. Let yeah. us roll another d20 Doo -doo -doo -doo. Right. and let's go back to the cards 16 16 16 all right i guess so when you uh when when uh when, when you sent me uh some of these uh notes uh for these questions i i looked over the lightning round and uh <laughs> I was like, oh God, I love these. I love these you, so much. I was about to say, are you afraid of them? Or are you okay? Yeah. No, no, I love them. I love them to death. Uh I yeah, I I don't explain the rules of this game half of the time because it's obvious. But yeah. if you roll if you roll doubles, you trigger the lightning round, yes, which has happened, yes. which happened on the first episode so far. It hasn't oh, nice. since a week, but oh. I also can do whatever I want. So yeah. I maybe the lightning round's on deck. Uh for this one, this is this is interesting. This is similar in some ways, but a nice a nice little like addendum to what we were just talking about. What common advice really only applies to more advanced game masters out there? There is a ton of advice for game masters. I think because there's a deficit provided by the system itself in in yep. a fifth edition context, but even in all the OS, like game masters like to talk about the game, so that's mostly what you get <laughs> is game masters talking to each other. Case in point, this here. Mm -hmm um but i find that there's some stuff that's a fifty thousand foot view that's not really contextualized that like a newcomer will like stumble over perhaps even like beat themselves up about not being good at right away so like what's 
And we could flip it too. Like, what's a cool piece of like advanced game master advice you have out there? But um I I guess I, I guess if I it to say something that new DMs feel that they often struggle with, um, I, I feel like this is a fairly common piece of advice um that that new DMs kind of need to hear. Um but is is can be tricky is I shit doesn't need to be perfect. Um, you know, it, it's it, it, don't don't beat yourself up because you're uh this this was a huge thing when um critical role was like really taking off that the whole Matt Mercer effect. Mm -hmm. Uh don't don't hold yourself to such high standards as long as you and your table are having fun. That's all that really matters. Um but something something that applies to more experienced DMs that is thrown around there. Um I, I think the thing that the, the advice that I've heard so many times that I just kind of shrug at is that you don't need to spend hours preparing to uh, preparing to run a good game because honestly in when you are beginning i think you need to spend at least 2 hours 2 to 3 hours before your game the night before the day the morning of getting to know what you want to do in that next session um so many like i i know um Michael Shea uh, and Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master is, is all about like very specific kinds of uh, game prep. And I honestly think that if you are a dungeon master, you should read that. Um, you should learn how to prepare efficiently and effectively. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that before your game, you need to spend some amount of time more than just like what some dms where it's like oh yeah no just just give yourself you know give yourself like 10 15 minutes and like you know roll some dice and stuff like that because i i've heard that thrown around because I, I feel like somebody like yourself or myself we could come to a table with a group of players and be able to run off the cuff um it would be easy enough to make up a stat block in our head come up with scenario set a dc uh, for what we feel is appropriate. But I, I feel that when you are new, you need to take the time to get a grasp on the rules and the mechanics and the overall feel, um, you know, understand your challenge ratings, understand your DCs of what it is you're going to be posing to your players. Because if, if you are not intimately familiar with that, um, then you will stumble. But again, back to like what I said before, don't be afraid to stumble, you know, but, but definitely take the time to try and build that skill because that is a skill. Mm. Um, running, mm. being a dungeon master is very much a skill. You have to be able to multitask. You have to be able to take good notes and recall them. Um, and one of the things that I, uh, you know, hear all the time is about how you know write your own notes from the notes that are in an adventure or something like that because you only need to know the things you you know you don't you can't just intimately remember um but yeah i just i just think like if you are new spend time prepping your game mm -hmm. spend time you know digging into it and finding out the nuances with stuff um one of the things that i i at this point, don't understand how I've gone 10 years without uh, is Keith Amon's book, The Monsters Know What They're Doing. I pulled it the, off the shelf yesterday. Yep. This, oh my God, like mm -hmm. I I pitted my players uh, in a Rhyme of the Frost mating game. They were flying between the Goliath's uh, mountain peaks and they were on the back of Griffins and I wanted them to fight some Paratons and I looked up how they would fight and I'm like, I never would have thought of this strategy where Paratons dive bomb their enemies mm. like that wasn't a thing that i would have thought of and mm. i've used that book so many times now that i i don't even know how i'd run it but like it takes you getting into that mindset of like sitting down and giving yourself a, a you know an hour to an opening a book and actually reading through something to properly prepare yourself yeah people sleep on perry taunts because I think they're like, it's like, that's oh, a Pegasus, but it's a deer, but it's a griff. I have a griffin. I have a chimera. I don't yeah. need another hybrid. 
Maritons are, I think, because they're not as scary at first. It's like, this is a deer. This is a deer that eats hearts and comes, yeah. and comes out of yeah. the sky. You, you see a shadow and then a, yeah. I love I, was, I love those I, monsters. I put them on a lot of my encounter tables. I was gonna uh, say, I like when I when I first saw, if, if, if to those of you watching this, if you've never seen a Paraton, mm. go look up a Paraton uh, in D&D lore because even their, even their just core 5e image is one of the most terrifying things ever mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh god it is they are horrifying um so you mentioned the lazy dungeon master which is also on the on the bookshelf behind me mm -hmm. um i uh i i, I did not do the mike shea sly Furch, deep dive links whatever links to all of these things will be downstairs um the yeah the, i i think because i conflated it with zero prep um because lazy dungeon mm. master whatever like and it is very it is very much not like if you do mike shay's method you're spending an hour or two i believe yeah preparing um mm -hmm. and he's just telling you how to prepare how like what to prepare what's important yeah. while you're running how to prepare efficient uh, efficiently i do like over prep is definitely a thing and i think it leads yes. to burnout very quickly because yeah. you prepared the wrong things and for new dms it's heartbreaking when you're like especially if it's home group i wrote all this lore yep. they don't care about the gods they don't care they just want to do weird stuff with the little like this doesn't matter the cool things over here like and i and i spent hours preparing that and i didn't prepare the correct thing so like i don't have stuff to throw in front of them to react because yeah. i just put all of my effort into this one perfect little again that perfectionist tendency too mm -hmm. and yeah i learned all of those things the hard way you know and that's what it is i could i could sit you i could sit down and run a game in an hour yeah. at my friendly game show i'm like it would be fine and the players would have a good time it would be much worse than if i ran it in three hours and spent two hours preparing for right. it and I have, I must have hit my 10,000 hours by now. Like I have a lot of, and that is all prep that every game I've run is now in my prep bank. Uh, you know, like mm -hmm. if I had to run a game this second, I would probably run a scenario that was a patchwork quilt of everything I've ever, I've done already. Yeah. You know, like you don't, don't be afraid of prep because that stuff stays with you. Yeah. Yep. And it's and it's building muscle. It's building yep. muscle. You can't be mad that you can only lift sixty pounds because you wanted to lift a hundred pounds. Like if you keep lifting the sixty, you get to seventy, and it's mm -hmm. incremental. And like I know to tinker with HP before I tinker with AC because I jacked the AC of a boss <laughs> when I was first. You know. Oh the, the my god! I've made the same mistake. Time. I just like miss, 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 miss. It's like oh shit! Like what yeah. do you? I don't. How do I? What? <laughs> I don't know what to uh. do now um funny enough there's the there's a book i i reviewed it on um i reviewed it over on my channel uh called nimble streamlined uh 5e and one of the things that they have in there is about um it, it's it actually takes away armor class hmm. um our armor class in essence doesn't function the same way in normal 5e um instead what it is is that you always hit and you're mm -hmm. always dealing damage mm -hmm. but you have so much you you can reduce that damage that's incoming but the way that they actually make it so you can still work it within 5e raise your raise your characters and your monsters hit point pools lower their acs no fu no fighter or you know barbarian loves when they go up and they get their two attacks and they miss on both of them mm -hmm. but everyone loves when they can go up and hit four times mm -hmm. because their action hit their bonus action hit their action surge hit and guess what the monster's still standing because you've bumped up their their hit points you know by a ton so yeah i've definitely made that mistake before of ramping up an ac and suddenly your players are like we can't do anything what's the purpose Yes. And I, you know, I can tell, I tell people that, you know, in some of like the, 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 the Fandalin videos, especially, I think I, it, it's in there. Um, but me saying it and you learning it the hard way, you're going to internalize one of those lessons much deeper. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so Very yeah, true. learn, learn, be willing to learn by doing that's, I mean, that's half the reason I started a YouTube channel. Yes. I'm, I'm, I still don't know if I'm good at any of this stuff, but it's like, I'm, I'm way better now oh. than when I started. Like, yeah. Um, because I have those tendencies. I'm not like, the, you know, 
I don't think either of us are like the man on the mountain being like, oh, don't worry about being perfect. It's like, I know because I tried for a long time and it's that, yeah. that way, that way madness lies. There's yeah. no good, no good outcomes I, come from that. Definitely. I, I still, after every single one of my sessions to, uh, to this day, uh, after each one, I sit there, uh, I, I, I disconnect from discord or I, I I'm driving home from the library and my mind's going, what could you have done better? What are the what what are the things? Oh, you forgot this. And oh, well, if you would have done this, this would have made it so much more impactful. And Matt Mercer does that on his drive yeah. from the studio. Yeah. Guaranteed it. I, I, uh, yeah, 100 like, percent. He's sitting there like not quite listening to Marisha because he's going through every mistake he made. Like it's it's, it's like, oh, shoot, shoot, I forgot that that monster had undying fortitude and I forgot to make that uh, make that right. constitution save. And right. oh, man, it's natural and it's. And if you're perfect, then it's boring and there's nowhere to go and you're, there's no yeah. growth left in life and whatever. Any, you, you, gr you grow anything. by losing. Yeah, um, that's 100%. I was reaching for the dice, but we're not doing dice anymore because this, ladies and gentlemen, is the lightning round. Oh, are you ready? Yes, you ready? I, I'm so ready. Okay, so in theory, these are short answer questions, but if we uh, continue to digress, I ain't going to fight you. Uh, do you fudge? Starting off strong. Oh, um, uh, all my players, uh, mute your ears. Um, yes, I do. Uh, I, I fudge. I fudge only in favor of my players as long as it makes the the game more narratively satisfying. Okay, um, good answer. I'll so, take it. Yeah, I, I will. I would never fudge a role that would make it harder for my players to succeed, but I would fudge a role when it makes my players look super cool. Mm, mm. My mind jumps to like social situations. Stuff like that, um, or like in combat, like even a hit, in combat, a hit, a hit to a miss. Uh, yeah, I would. Now, I, I will say the system that I use is very hard to like hide some of those rules. Um, but like if my like the players, v, the, are, I'm sorry, the VTT system, you mean VTT, like the, yeah, okay, encounter yeah. plus, yeah, because I have I have a way to do public roles and I have a way to do private roles. Um, and if my players are trying to like enthrall a character, and I think it's super fitting and would be more narratively. Uh, fitting for them to get that. Mm. Um, I'll say, okay, you fail. And if they call me out, they're like, well, I didn't see the dice roll. I'm like, oh, shoot, sorry, I had it on private. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. in my opinion, it is it is better to create a better story to to allow your players to shine rather than to just sit there and watch them frustratingly try to bash their heads against the wall. Yes, I think you can do, I roll in the open well, yeah. like pretty much 100 percent of the time now um mm -hmm. and it's and it's playing without a net it's exciting in some ways for me yep. and the players but like there's been plen plenty like three moments i could think of in the last three weeks where it's like mm, i should that yeah i shouldn't have Oof. and maybe that's a system problem like maybe it's a 5e problem more than a me problem but like yeah i'm not i'm not uh yeah fudge if you want especially i think especially if you're new right like yes. i think there's a lot of people like it's cheating they haven't they haven't run a game before no. <laughs> um, yeah what is your favorite die size uh, oh, I oh god, I have to say the D twenty. Uh, okay. Well, okay. you know what? No. Uh, so I will say the D twenty. Um, I can't move my camera right now, but I have I have a slew of D twenties in uh various size, ranging from this big honking metal oh. one to this little itty bitty tiny metal one I mm -hmm. keep in front of me. Uh, if I, but honestly, so what's your favorite? Cause those are two different questions. So you're answering a different question, I think. Cause like my favorite, okay. my favorite dice is definitely a D20. Cause I have the most variety of those. Oh. What's your favorite platonic solid, right? What's your favorite? Oh. Uh, and it could be a D20 could be the answer. Um, but what's um, your favorite D4, D6, D8, D10, D12? D12. Oh. D12. That's because the of the, because of the barbarian. Uh -huh. I, my yes. very first character was a barbarian named Kelf. And it's their hit die, and it was his great axe, mm -hmm. and and I had to have multiple, and I have his set in in a box with that's his death box, uh, because that character died, mm -hmm. so it's uh, it's a very special one to me. Don't be afraid of your characters dying because those are your favorites. The other ones oh, fade so... into obscurity because somebody's yep. work schedule changed or something. Uh, published or homebrew? Adventures. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um published with homebrew elements where i see fit mm. um i it's, it's how i run all my campaigns i will i will take someone else's work and i will change 75 percent of it to fit what i need but like i i will i will be their meat of their skeleton oh uh, woo 
never heard it yeah. quite that way, but I like yeah, it. Yeah, that, that, that was a way that I, I used to, I said that once before where it's like, I will take the bones of your adventure and I will put my meat and skin over it. So it looks like my own, but underneath I am technically just piloting your skeleton. Yeah. Cause watch, I mean, look at, at Fandolin 5, like you can recognize some elements of mm -hmm. The, all yeah. of those Fandolin adventures, hundred um, percent, yeah. But like, he, he, there's a million. I mean, you have a million plot hooks hanging, and it's like that's all homebrew, as far as yeah. I know. I mean, maybe yeah, stole from somebody else, but that all that all started out as uh, that that campaign started out as Dragon of Ice Spire Peak. But before session one, uh, she doesn't play with us anymore. But she was going to play. She was playing a druid. Um, one of my players, Michelle, she said. Oh, uh, my village was attacked by a dragon. That's why I'm out hunting this dragon. And I said, cool, what kind of dragon? Knowing that the white dragon is the one in Dragon Vice Fire Peak, she goes, it was a fire breathing dragon. And I was like, oom, like there's the there's the continuing story. We're gonna go into Rise of Tiamat. And Perfect. so building up into the homebrew with that was just, you know, phenomenal. Um, encumbrance question mark? Oh. Uh, I hate it. Asked and answered. It. Uh, yeah. <laughs> favorite yeah, class. Give me, uh, favorite class bard. Hundred percent. Favorite. Uh, lineage, space, uh, species, race, whatever we want to call them. Bloodline. Which I'm, I don't think that's gonna win. <laughs> I like um, lineage. I think ancestry. Uh, uh, ancestry is the one is the one that I like. Uh, because if we do it that way, it's ancestry background class A B C. Hard to argue. Um, with systems acronyms. Yeah uh favorite favorite race i i love i love halflings so much because i i i see myself as a halfling mm. uh but i have made more warforges than anything else and it's what most of my friends uh who have played with me know me as because i played a warforged bard from level 1 to 20 uh, mm. in a campaign and i mm. love cooper i have a picture of him on the back of my door so i see him every day when i walk out of my room he's on the um, uh he's on the balcony on the show he is right? yep yeah. yep over in the tavern uh he's up on the balcony he's wearing his classic teal and pink um and yeah he's he, he is like a character i would never forget um so. combat as sport or combat as war are you familiar with that like Framing that's more OSR than 5e, I think. But. Oh, I I mean, combat as sport or combat as war. I'm trying to, what is, was that? What does that entail? I will say, um, how how deadly is the game that you run? That's a that's not that's almost the same question. Oh, um, okay. It, I want it as deadly as it can be, where my players feel like they could not make it to the next long rest mm -hmm. but that as long as they make smart tactical choices and they work as a team then they will see it through then there's no way they wouldn't see it through but if they're foolish if they're trying to like uh you know lone wolf stuff or solo things and and they're they're making you know they're making unwise choices then it is brought upon themselves mm -hmm, uh mm -hmm. their their demise that makes sense to me uh roll for stats standard ray point by 3d6 down oh, the line what's your point, point by as as a uh like i said before as a min maxer as an optimizer give me give me my my ability to choose mm -hmm. uh personally it's why i actually like pathfinder 2's way of rolling stats mm -hmm. where you just assign your modifiers Mm -hmm. um and and i i definitely prefer that but yeah point by uh through and through um do you tend to gravitate towards game balance or realism the old verisimilitude game balance or realism um that's maybe a false dichotomy actually now that i'm hearing myself say that question out loud but yeah what what do you what do you mean like um because you mean like fantasy versus realism no but like this is a fair fight versus like this is what would happen because you said there's a red dragon in the mix and like it wouldn't be this hp pool or what you know oh um i would say balanced um i i have i have ran encounters that that i could 100 percent just wipe the floor with my players um with a sneeze and uh but i i will i will hold stuff back because i i want the story mm -hmm. um you know i brennan lee mulligan uh f phenomenal dm once said uh you know it's like player like if players are like water 
they their their characters are like water they want the fastest straightest path down the hill mm -hmm. but the characters the players themselves want the winding path that takes the longest because they want that story arc mm -hmm. i as the dm want the same thing um you know i want it to seem like i was going full hog at my players the entire time but in truth i want to tell a story with that monster's uh abilities i want it to build up to something because i don't want to start out just hitting them with the biggest thing and you know making them lose their their zeal good answer uh flying characters kosher yeah okay. if they're in the book i have i have mm. flying enemies guess what <laughs> they'll, <laughs> they'll be right up there with you i have enemies with bows they'll shoot you uh um i think this is gonna be a hard one for you because you've you've dropped i don't even know how many uh in this conversation already yeah uh, your favorite or the best third party tool out there oh um i actually don't think that's gonna be hard for me at all it's uh 5e dot tools um <laughs> that's a website that i i use um it's it's kind of a touchy site um because it has a lot of reference material on it uh it's meant for utilizing for information you already have purchased officially from D, &D beyond oh, uh, or i mean or from from D, D that you you own as just a fast reference and there's a there's a lot of points on that uh about it uh you know being unkosher mm -hmm. but as a reference site it is hands down number one the best thing in the world as as a quick reference catalog uh other than that uh encounter plus if mm -hmm. if I if I would not say that I would say Encounter Plus as a VTT. So, but if either of those, uh, mm -hmm. if, you know, and I, I'm jumping around, uh, Foundry. Foundry has both of those tied in with one another. They have reference, resource, compendiums, and VTT. So Foundry Virtual Tabletop, phenomenal. He, there's, it's Foundry is like the. The obscure band with the rabid fans like nobody likes foundry everybody loves it or hasn't played it yeah <laughs> like, yeah it's... if if you've used it you know why it's great yeah people um, love it... foundry fans love foundry yeah. and the nice thing is is that unlike a lot of other vtts that require um that require everyone to buy like uh fantasy grounds you know everyone's got to buy a license for it with that one it's a one it's it's just a one-time purchase encounter plus is a monthly you know is a monthly thing that i i pay for but foundry one time purchase you get access to everything there's all kinds of modules you can pay for support different creators on there uh but yeah like i said uh for me it would it would still be 5e dot tools i i don't know how i would run my games without it mm -hmm. um links below uh favorite non D, D game or let's say fifth let's say any any edition um tabletop rpg yeah favorite ttrpg oh, oh, oh. that's that's not uh, fifth edition crawl crawl Ooh. Kroll. Kroll. Ooh. no P P R O L E. oh uh, I, i'm seeing the I, yeah I, yeah it, sorry yeah. 80s baby crawl, <laughs> crawl is a it's an obscure rpg that i got in a bundle of random rpgs on itch.io and it's a it's it's a coin based system. Uh -huh. So when you go to make a when you go to do uh, a skill check, attack somebody, influence somebody, you flip a coin, and if it's heads, you succeed. If it's tails, you fail. Ooh. If you're skilled in it, you can flip the coin twice, and you only need to succeed on one. Or if you are unskilled or have a disadvantage, you have to succeed on both uh, in order to get it. And it's the most simple, broken down system. That's it. Mm -hmm. You come up with your own rules and it's just storytelling with a coin. And I love it because it's how tabletops started. It, it's how adjudication started. You flipped a coin and you saw who won. I'm going to check that out. I'm going to check yeah. that out for sure. That sounds it like is. the game you play, you know, in the bar or the coffee shop when you've you're trying to explain what D, &D is like to someone yeah. and you're 20 minutes in you're like you know what hold on you take out a quarter it's like i'll just show you it's it's gonna be easier <laughs> yeah it's so good i i absolutely love it and uh like i said it's one of those things that i i got in an obscure 
RPG bundle. And to this day, I still go back and look at it uh, and, and like design characters based on the goofy items and stuff that they have within it. So yeah, roll. Um, we're going to take a quick break, but for you, it will be, we'll be right back in an instant. In the meantime, go drop a comment of your favorite obscure game I've never heard of, please and thank you, or a, uh, a 5e tool um, online yeah. or otherwise. And yeah, we'll be right back. Woo! And we're back. Back. Uh, and we're going to roll on the Game Master's Compendium of Explosive Creation, and we're making a fortune teller, which I am super excited about. I'm pretty sure Lucas is excited about because he's going to steal all my ideas and use them for his stuff, right? <laughs> 100%. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited because my over on Kel's corner, uh, where we're, uh, March we're, we're doing every month. We're doing a different theme for homebrew material and March is the whims of luck and fate. Um, yeah, where you navigate the capricious tides of fate and fortune mm. and the background we're going to create that month is a fortune teller. Uh, so I'm super excited to build this character because, uh, I, I'm going to have a lot of play into it. Well, you are you are welcome to take whatever we generate here and use it with my blessing. Um, yeah. We're, we're going to start on the character side first. As is tradition, you're going to roll one of every die size. All uh, right. For, for going a D100 if it's in your hand. But 20, 12, I, 10, I, 8, 6, 4. I do have a D100. I, I have a solid so D100. The, so there's, there's going to be 50 backgrounds. The <laughs> index is going to, you can roll a D100 to determine which background. That's going to mm. be the, the index to get that D100 in there. And there's a bunch of D100 tables. Um, and like the bonus, uh, some of the stretch goals we unlocked, some of the other stuff I just like felt the need to include. All righty then. All right. So, so our D20 uh, is going to tell us our, our drive, our dream, our aspiration. What's making this character tick what's our motivation number seven to find a better and faster way to make money oh that it that tells us a lot about our character right away so let's um I, let That's... me ask you did you start do you have an idea do you have a character concept walking no, in today okay I, I didn't i didn't so uh i i will say this i i have notes for um i i do have notes for the background uh, that I'm going to be designing uh, in in March for, for the ones of luck and fate. And one of the things, the feature I'm doing is about this character being able to do uh, readings for people. Mm. But the skill proficiency that I'm giving this background is deception. So uh, mm -hmm. it's deception and insight. So this is, in my mind, this is already it. Because in my opinion, most fortune tellers are, uh, you know, they they they... They they do some nefarious things. I've had I mean I've had some experiences like I'm a fairly uh, logical, rational, scientifically minded. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I would call myself a skeptic because that capital S skeptics are now a, a different belief system <laughs> post to like yeah. But um, I have had some experiences that have like convinced me that there's it makes sense that we don't understand everything. We're not yeah. the people who have out, have it all figured out. It's not twenty twenty four is the year that we we've, we've got it. I've seen people tap into stuff, <laughs> uh, but I've also seen plenty of people uh, cold read or attempt to cold read because I yep. I played a lot of poker back in the day and like I have a decent poker face, so I've definitely given some <laughs> fortune tellers uh, a, a, a challenge, let us say. Um, but yeah, some of these motivations are. Uh, more character defining than others. Let's put it that way. There's a range yeah. of uh, strengths and emphases in all of these tables, but uh, you're going to be an adventurer because you want a faster, better way to make money because you've been, you know, deceiving people for a couple coppers at a time at the at the tavern right. or the local carnival. Or absolutely love this already. Absolutely um... love this already. Give me a give me a D eight. I already have a, like a very clear vision of like how we started adventuring, but this is a catalyst to call to adventure. Um, and these are actually, I think these. I'm sorry, this is the D twelve. I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh, D twelve. Yeah. I'm thinking about the the, the arc already. Where we're going to go from this? But the um, the, this D twelve table is like a treasure trove for when like you just need to insert something here. Mm -hmm. uh, what'd you get on the twelve? All right. Uh, we got a six. A patron asks for way more than a reading. Mm. Oh, well, that's that. Is, I'm sorry, sir. That is a way to make some money. 
that is that is a great way to make some money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Someone comes into the into the tent or wherever it is that you're sitting through the beaded curtain. <laughs> With yeah your crystal ball and you think it's another couple coppers and you're just like oh this guy looks rich maybe he'll uh or she'll like uh, you know tip me out or something and it's not yeah. it's not your typical request yeah it's, yeah it's it's you know you're you're sitting there you're part of like some some sideshow uh sideshow attraction of like traveling entertainers you know the great the great gambino and you're the one they're reading and this this guy comes in and he's like He's like, I, I need you to reach out to someone, you know, it's, it's like, I am, I, I, I need, I need a contact and it's like, oh, okay. It's like, it's like, this is, this is a little more, this is a little more. So it's like, Hey, maybe, uh, maybe there's some extra money to be made in this one. That's rich. Uh, Ooh. all yeah, right. Cause, Cause patron it's lower P patron. So it doesn't imply that you're yeah. a warlock, but it's that the potential Ooh. is there Ooh. That and is, like you, if i walk into know, a fortune teller and like i need you to contact someone for me i'm just going to assume that that person is dead do, right? do you know you He's, know what uh funny enough you say that i had like because when i saw when i saw lowercase patron my mind went to like uh guild master's guide to ravnica style stuff where you have a group patron right who's uh like furnishing the party and and uh kind of feeding them and financing them um a capital P patron coming in who maybe they are, maybe they're an entity, a powerful eldritch entity that uh, controls fate. Mm -hmm. And you have been giving unerringly very accurate readings to people. Um, and they're like, there's a little like, like, okay, I'm, I'm coming here either because uh, you've gotten suspiciously too close and I want to know what you're doing. Or I have actually been bankrolling your entire life up until this point, and you, if you want to continue doing what you're doing, you're going to have to do some favors for me. I think I am leaning, and this is your character, I'm not going to tell you what to do with it, but because of the title, The Great Gambino, I really like the idea of, like, this inadvertently, like, through just cold reading and bullshitting, uh, <laughs> they've, like, stumbled upon the truth to the point where, like, yeah, some deity of fate has noticed. <laughs> like, yeah. And, they, uh, and you have no idea that that's been happening for however long. Oh, that my just, God. That just, I don't know, that just pleases the the, the comedy side of me. That's um, amazing. All right, let's get a friendly faction. Factions make oh, stuff that's... happen. So um, and it's D4. not necessarily it's a d4 it's not necessarily something you're a member of i mean it may be but it could be someone that you are better than neutral with all right so we got two glass uh breath and flame glass blowers guild producing divination tools and much else mm -hmm. well right there where obviously our uh our, our character is uh rocking around with a crystal ball mm-hmm um that mm -hmm. is that is a hundred percent the case they're they're rocking up with a crystal ball um and they're they're causing their mayhem and mischief yeah i like so. that a lot and that can lead into like i need to like glass blowers one i'm just like blowing glass is cool uh, mm -hmm. um two like oh you want a potion where are you gonna put it you know yeah uh, and then I get, get creative with it you know like broken glass is a you know area of effect deterrence very much so, area denial funny enough this actually uh this actually reminds me of something i did uh i did to my players in my private game just recently um cursed potion bottles Ooh. not cursed potions because i had my players um they they were given potions of uh of rest which gives them everything that is like recoverable on a long rest or short rest but it doesn't give them hit points but an hour after drinking it it gives you a level of exhaustion uh because you're basically foregoing and creating a long rest uh very quickly and it's kind of like you know almost like a drug thing but what they did not pick up on when they identified this potion that was being given to them is that the vial is cursed. And the curse is that when you drink anything from this, you are paralyzed and blinded 
for one minute on a mm. wisdom save or mm. I mean, a constitution save. Mm. So maybe they could make you, uh, maybe they have uh, with these breath and flame, maybe they're making uh, something that has a magical effect within the vial itself. That opens up a lot of opportunities, like uh, yeah, like a like a uh, a flask of like potency, right? It's like yeah. doubles doubles the effect or doubles the dosage or or uh or or a, a flask of influence where it uh it gives you disadvantage on uh on wisdom saves to be charmed as like a here let's wet your whistle a little bit just get some like yeah i see like a crystal stemmed uh yep. like here. champagne flute or like, yeah you, you, know. you 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 pour yourself you pour yourself a glass and they take a sip from it and you know identify identify does not detect curses so and you're identifying the liquid the liquid the, correct like you have to specify Every, that's it right that's, Trixie, Every, everyone like everyone it. thinks that it's the liquid that's poison but you, you, you never suspect the glass itself mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> that's, that's why you always drink from the bottle ladies and gentlemen uh, that's right. um assets and allies a friendly npc which is always nice to hand your dungeon master uh what's the d6 all right we got one vera lane a wizened diviner who prefers to just tell folks the nice things they want to hear oh isn't that nice that's very oh. like i got a very like grandmotherly vibe from that just yeah. like oh dearie you're gonna die in four days but i'm not gonna tell you yeah <laughs> want to change anything have a cookie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 I I yeah, she she gets this she gets this vision where like they they suddenly fall ill three days from now and four days they're uh you know they're lying in bed uh dying from from fever and it's like I foresee in four days times you will be surrounded by those you love, your friends and family in a in a dear embrace. And that honestly, that could play into like that could play into some dark, twisted stuff where it's you know you you come up with you come up with like very ominous readings but you mm. pose it in such the 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 greatest uh mm. you you will be uh you you will find a great wealth will will come to you in a time of need and days from now a chest filled with like treasure falls on you uh crushing you and it's like <laughs> oh man the old gypsy was right yeah oh. <laughs> it's like it's like oh as you're laying there you're laying there as your as your like hip is crushed by a mim like like an entire chest of gold goblets and it's like oh i should why and that's very circling back to the the the, the, the calendar collection mm -hmm. um the i like my fey to be irish as hell i like the celtic like, oh yeah this is a slightly more attractive person who lives forever and has pointy ears like okay cool mm. no this shit is so alien yeah. to your <laughs> conception and like you don't see you see it looks like a beautiful person because you see what it wants you to see yep yeah and like yeah, yeah. Do, do, don't trust the fae don't trust the mean... and this like mother maiden crone sort of like tides of fate and like it's one person but it's three the the the, the, the triptych shamrock like it's not yeah it appears in other places too but um <laughs> the um yeah just this like ooh, because like you took it to a dark place which i was impressed at how quickly you came up with that like yeah double double bladed prophecy there like i'm i'm all man. that that is that is what i love i love to like seed things uh where where it, you don't know which way it's going i love that subversion of expectations where it's like it's like, oh, this sounds like a this sounds like a really nice thing. Days later, uh, you, you, you know, it's it's uh, you know your your wit is as sharp as it will as, as you know as a dagger. Days later, uh, you know you're in an adventure and some assassin comes up and puts a dagger through you know the back of your head and it's like your your wit is now you know sharpened by the dagger. And the the oh. reason like the the witch in the forest is scary isn't because she's weird looking right it's not the it's not the wart on her nose she's got a candy house she's the yeah. most appealing thing <laughs> right. and you're just like what is that intoxicating aroma yeah. and you just float to it like just like this this grandmotherly like oh dearie have a cookie is could be the big bad evil guy of your whole campaign yeah 
Uh, this was supposed to be your friend, but no, I, I'm sorry. I did the. I I try not to do that too often, but this time we're we're doing it. <laughs> yes. Uh, you were and whatever you were raised by this person. What does that mean for you? Oh, yeah. I could I could see her. I could see her if our if our character is like, um, is is somebody who's who's out there. Um, you know, who's wanting who's a fortune teller who's wanting to find a, another way of making money i mean i i i, th I think having her being there kind of is like somebody who who helped develop your skills mm -hmm. um and and being it where it's like it's like look if somebody if you tell somebody that they're going to die in a week they might not pay you they might run out of here screaming and running and they're afraid now but if you if you tell them that you know no 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 they they will uh in in days time they will come to know uh you know a sensation of warmth and love uh that they have that they have not felt since they were a child it's like you're not technically lying when you say that you know they're uh, their long lost father is going to come and, you know, strangle them with a warm blanket. It's, you know, and they're going to be reunited with their, with their, uh, their brethren, their, their siblings who have, who have all uh, fallen in the same fate in, you know, in the ethereal realm. It's that you are, you're giving them something to live on. Okay. I'm going to make a special request so we can edit this out later. Yeah. Uh, but that's also a lie. Never trust the fake. Um, I am requesting in this month's edition, or in the in March's uh, sure. Fates and Luck, you are exceptionally good at these weird, dark prophecies. I need I need ten to twelve of them at the at the very least. Hundred <laughs> percent. I, I can a you just you just gave you, you just gave us four like yeah. that. You are you are very good at that. Um, no, nope, I will definitely do that. You've clearly practiced. Uh, <laughs> Prophecies are my favorite thing in the world because they can be so vague, mm -hmm. and you can you can put them wherever you want when they finally reveal themselves. Mm -hmm. I I had a flash of like maybe this is your patron, like your warlock patron, not the person who walked in to send Ooh. you on your quest, but this like grandmotherly figure who taught you, and that's why you're actually predicting the future, but don't realize you, you, your grandma taught you all these tricks. You know, yeah, but she was actually infusing you with this, like, with uh, secrets beyond mortal ken. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, yes. From the Feywild. I was just about to say she. Th this could just be a straight up hag. This could be a hag that uh, that that raised you um, to to teach. Oh my god! What if this was a hag? What if this was like some uh, like she was your patron, like you said, with a capital P. Um, who, because I guess you could go Archfey, mm -hmm. um, and if this was your patron who got their power from the, like, from the fact that through the telling of dark fortunes that people, that, that people gain joy out of them, like, like this dark, twisted this dark and twisted sensation that she gets that like, like it kind of, kind of like that, uh, the end of a receipt where it's like, have you felt satisfied by your visit today? Where it's like, so long as you can hit that check mark, she gets like some amount of power that, that joy that you feel mm -hmm. because, because she is feeding on the dread that you are not having anymore. Like your dread has been lifted and that is what she can siphon off. And so she taught you how to read fortunes in such a way that makes people feel really good when they walk out and you're alleviating this sense of woe that they might have because she is literally like siphoning that off from these people. So they don't feel bad over the next couple of days when suddenly, you know, their, their demise comes as quickly as their fortune did. Tell your friends. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, send you, yeah, send send the friends and family over, <laughs> and like that's a that's a project for like a mercurial immortal fake creature to be like, I want to tell people they're gonna die and they're gonna thank me for it. Yes, yes, exactly. exactly. And they'll say, Oh, I'll see you. Like oh. this was this was great. We'll be back next year. It's like, no, you won't, Terry. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> oh my god, like, that would be that that would be a hundred percent just uh 
like a bet that they could make, you know, um, like they, they make it with a God of death or something like that. It's like, I bet you anything. I can tell people that they're going to die and they will pay me money and they will walk away with a smile. Mm. And it's like, it's like you are, you are getting these, these super cryptic, uh, very obscure fortunes and people are like, Oh man, cool. I'm going to, I'm going to see my friends and family. I haven't seen them in so long. I'm going to be surrounded by them. It's like, Oh boy, here we go. Thanks. Here's, here's five gold. Here's, here's a three years worth of my salary. <laughs> you, well, yeah. <laughs> the, well, let's not get into the DD. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, gold is gold is such a hassle. All right. So this is the part that is on in, almost in the gutter. This is the part that's the transitional. Some dungeon masters are not going to want to allow their players to roll on this. I always tell people um, if, you know, it depends, you're starting at level one, you're starting at level three, you're doing a level 21 shot or whatever. Um, but you don't necessarily have to hand this out of character creation. If a player knows that there's a magic item out there, yep. they, they will chase it to the ends of the earth. Um, so what did you, what'd you get on your D10? All right. Uh, we got a four. The Bone China Teacup does not help reading leaves, but drank, uh, but a drink from it restores one health every day. Hmm. Oh. Okay. Um bone. Oh my god, it's made of bone. That's sick. Um I love that because that, that could just be that could be bones of one of the hags uh one of the hags victims. That's definitely it was definitely grandma's, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um no, this this plays this plays very much into uh into that whole idea of like having a drink that is mm. one thing and having uh you know an enchanted vessel as another thing um where maybe one of the ways uh that this particular fortune teller does their readings is when you come in um cuz i i know that like a thing i actually didn't know this until i started looking to fortune tellers um to build the background is you can read fortunes in tea leaves. Oh yeah, that's um, why that's why that's in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. When I saw that, I was like, I was like, oh yeah, this plays into that. Like, if if your character is a tea leaf reading teller, like this could be part of that show, part of that performance. Mm. But them drinking from their cup lowers their inhibitions, allows them. Uh, allows them like mechanically you could have it be where uh you know if the scenario would play out in game where it gives them a disadvantage on their wisdom save um but even still it just lowers their inhibition it makes them more likely to be positive and agreeant in whatever tellings you are giving them but yours or the hags uh vera you know hers could be you know this one where it was it was the first one she did, and it it now is the thing that that restores her that restores her vitality that that one health every day that kind of keeps her going. Mm, mm. Mm, I like that a lot. Oh, man. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance, but the great uh, the great Gambino is that what? I don't know. I see. I think it was. I think I said the great Gasbino or something like that. The great that, but... Gasbino, the tea leaf reading tiefling. Oh yes. That, yes. is that is that something that felt <laughs> I, i'm i'm writing it up i'm i'm putting it i have i i have the uh the guide up on the screen so i'm i'm marking down everything we're doing and uh yeah the great gatsbino oh like great uh, gatsby is that what you're pulling on no but that is a, that is the, such the a great, play on the a, great gatsbino is on, yeah, on, yeah, a, yeah. on a very deceptive kind of person I mean, he's that's a that's a charlatan maybe, but that was a, yeah. uh, but he I mean he was playing he was a, he made a fortune the quick way the dirty way. Fortune telling tiefling. Yeah, I'm all for this high charisma, um, that infernal charm, an allure about them of like their devilish ways and and how it's you know like just just that aspect of it that is pulled, uh, you know. Being somebody who has an infernal background, most people are gonna uh, are are you know maybe gonna have that like you know sense of allure towards them. Mm. Um, yeah, that's that's sick. Um, I guess we should do the uh, the character arc. This is yeah. This is 
dope. Did I skip that? Oh, you, that's funny. I because I, I I jumped to it and then I completed it in that part of my brain. Uh, yeah. Well, we skipped the D eight. I don't even know if we need this anymore. But what's what, what you get? Um, we'll we'll take a look at what we got. Uh, we, we got a seven, following to free from a false prophecy. So these are the these are the most complex. Uh, yeah. Like. I don't this even know linguistic about... challenges for me, but like following a false prophecy to being free from a false prophecy. If I had mm. more space, is what I would. Oh, oh, oh! I see. No, I see what you're saying. So you are following a false prophecy. the The arc is to free yourself from that false prophecy. Maybe, maybe what got you into it is that uh, is that Vera Lane uh, read you your fortune, um, and maybe you were like one of her first. But the fortune that came, like the the fortune that she foretold, did not come true, mm. and she then reread you, and it's like, it, you know, she's she's kind of lied to you this whole time about like, you know, what that fortune was or wasn't. Mm. Um, honestly, though, there is a part of me that really likes number two on that list of faking the gift to mastering divination. And that's allowed. <laughs> if you see yes. one, the only time I'm like, eh, maybe not is the, the, the magic items because they are like, very, in, very in, in power. In, yeah. But um, yeah, if the, the, the blanket statement for all of these, one, like I, there's instructions in the book, but like use it however, to rip it apart for spare pieces and use it however you like. But um, if you roll and you're like, oh, I wish I got that one. Cool. That's yeah. then it answered it for you. Or you're like, oh, that would have been cooler if cool. It's doing its job. If you're like, that's dumb. He should have written this. Like, <laughs> great. They, yes. It's that's what I I did my job. I'm satisfied. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. If some if it suggests something else, that's why we roll on tables half the time. Yeah. Um, but that, I like that... this idea of like the, the the you're half a charlatan to making deals with the fates. Yeah. yeah. And that's that that kind of is like the idea that I'm that, that I'm, I'm I'm liking is where where their their Vera Lane is is a is a diviner. She she is like a hag with divination magics um, who who has somehow enchanted you somehow, you know, uh, brought you on board to be the vessel through which she she gets these readings and she gets this energy. and. You don't necessarily have it. You know, she's she's teaching you, like you said, these charlatan ways of being able to fake it. But through that, you you eventually start to develop. Maybe, you know, you get insights and whispers from beyond the veil. Um, you know, something maybe, you know, maybe one of the glass blowers, you ask them for, you know, for a cup. Um, you know, something that they can, you know, just a simple, a, a simple t cup whenever you're doing your, your tea leaf reading. And um, that in itself is, is they imbue it with a bit of divination. They, they give you that added insight to, to brief uh, or glimpse, a glimpse, a brief moment in the future. Um, that is the truth of what is going to happen. and like that starts to build into your necessitation of like, am I like, am I doing things for the right reason or the wrong reason? Mm. You know, like, like, cause I, I feel like part of this might end up being, is this character going to go down, going to go down this path and maybe have to, as you go along, find out the truth about who it was that raised you find out what they're going on, like what's going on with them um, and having to put an end to that. But I think that's going to come up on page two when we start getting into the antagonists, because uh, I, I, I right now I feel like we have a lot of ways that this can go. All right, let's do, 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 do switch over to the other side of the coin and this is the game master facing side i mean depending on what kind of game you're running maybe you know it'd be interesting to collaborate with players ahead of time but you're with the player input you're almost storyboarding at that point yeah i um, abs I, I have actually used this um I, i've used uh the compendium 
with a group of people to build characters for a one shot mm -hmm. um just to try it and i'll tell you what it it went from being if it was something where that was like a session zero for a long long-term campaign would have been the greatest thing in the world it ended up becoming us storyboarding a tale that would have happened and mm. just it, it went from being something that we were going to play to being something that we sat down and just had one of the greatest times coming up with a story and that could be a that, that could be played for a group of characters that there was an open endedness that went along with it that could have been a entire campaign and i'll tell you what that is the one thing that i have loved about this is that it it builds the stories and this is how i plan on doing my next campaign um because i, I want my next campaign to be very open very sandbox and i want my players backstories to be the driving force and this is my plan with that that is that is deeply gratifying to hear thank you yeah i yeah. love the um yeah like re releasing this into the world early and getting it into creative people's hands like yourself like has been really eye-opening so like just watch people like take the ball and run with it it's like oh i didn't even think about like yeah just using this as like oh, yeah this could be a, a creative writing tool this yeah could be yeah this could be a mini game in and of itself because if you in theory you know you have four to five players you have you know we just we just built a whole we use half of the, the just yeah. the character side and like you could run i could run i don't even know that's five six sessions easily of material mm -hmm. in there so the oh, interesting this... part is how it interconnects and how the other character stuff starts to yeah. collide with the things that we pulled yeah it's it's interesting the interactivity of it all makes me excited as a dm this in itself is already a character i would put in a uh wild beyond the Witchlight uh the the carnival this mm. is this is the fortune teller in it their adventure is the players go up to them um the 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 players get a reading from them and this play this npc like breaks down what he does and like gives them a reading but then confesses he's like oh, i don't actually know what i'm doing he's like he's like you know i i drink from this thing and i get this insight and you know he finally breaks down and the players then have to like go out and you know hunt down this hag that he's been mm. he's been raised by uh in in order to like resolve the truth of the matter and and fight against her and all these people who have who have unknowingly walked into tragedy because of her uh, give like, me a D, give me a D six because that feels like that's gonna that could tie in very right. nicely or rub against uh, an antagonistic organization. Who else is who else is pulling strings around here? So we are going with number three, the mm -hmm. waning crescent. Structure their lives around moon phases and are secretly lycanthropes. Mm. That is cool because I mean, what you could you could read? Could you could you read? read fortunes in the moons you can do uh, i suggest you there everything has been used for divination at some point in history like you go to the wikipedia true. disambiguation for maybe divination i don't know what the like the blanket term is but like yeah. every freaking they used to like you know like i messed around with the eaching some like a while ago and like they used to like read turtle shells or like you know, could, oh, true. Yeah. Consult the bones, right? <laughs> like, all just any, anything and everything. So I'm sure there's some like wild name for consulting the moon phases to. to oh, yeah. The moon future. phase prediction. Yeah. There's got to be some like Latinate weird word for it, too, right? Like, yeah, that is. Oh, man. Um, that is, that's a, that's cool. I don't know. I'm I, honestly, the, uh, the the one the one that's hitting me though because of because of this last one that we did because of the character arc of faking the gift to mastering divination mm -hmm. uh i i honestly think the one i i want to go with is the veil piercers because okay. that to okay. me charlatans who distrust and disparage anyone with real abilities mm -hmm. that to me is is it is it is in this instant of seeing that one has completely swapped this character design from being 
this is a this is a, a person this is a tiefling who has been faking it as part of a traveling circus a patron comes in one day a hag what's her name vera lane she says i will teach you the ways to truly read how the the fortunes of those that walk into your that walk into your tent and all i ask is that when you when you read for them that they sip from this teacup that that you mm. you feast with them and and you 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 have them drink this mm. and you yourself having a having your own glass uh maybe from the glass blowers um that is providing you that that maybe gave you like glimpses you know maybe it was something but it was never truly anything anything beyond just like a, a a spoof now it's like she is bestowing upon you these actual divination powers and the veil piercers as you're traveling with them or maybe even now traveling alone um to say like hey you know uh i'm doing my own thing now or even it's still in the backstory traveling with them where they're like some of your fortunes are starting to get a little uh a little specific you're supposed to keep them vague you're supposed to keep them so that they can maybe apply to to anyone but uh you know you you just you really played into that last one what's going on there um and you know maybe this could be like a patron with a capital p almost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh i like that a lot in my yeah. my head the uh the waning crescent were the the like the roadies for the for the traveling carnival right those oh. are the guys just like breaking it putting it up and taking it down and they have like very specific times where they'll work right oh, so yeah. like that's <laughs> dictating like where the carnival is going to be next is like interesting their union contract is based on the moon phase <laughs> and right, they're like right. only they only set up at night that's why the carnival just seems to like appear the next morning because like yeah they have a very specific way of doing things Oh man, you, I don't want that to be antagonistic at all. I want that to be my allies. Well, it could be I, like, yeah. Oh, I mean, you, it's it's it, open ended, depending on what the player yeah. does. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Like, but I feel like those dudes might feel a certain. They might one, they they're gonna be like very insular, right? They're very, yeah, super. very tight knit. And two, like you know, like the 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 the, the labor guy and like the talents. There's mm. a, there's there's a, there's a structural conflict yeah. there to start, right? Like yeah oh man i this when you when you describe that i'm like i'm like oh my god i love these guys already right yeah the whole guy yeah i relate to them so this is like yeah i just like i just move the stuff i don't know lady get out <laughs> I yeah. like that. um whoops uh all right give me another d6 all right uh we got a one we doing uh rival enemies yes so this oh. might i mean this could put this could rise to the level of a big bad evil but this is also potentially like someone who was mean to us in high school and like we can't necessarily kill them because it would mean a lot of trouble for us right uh dorlin brandy blames the character for not making him listen to advice he ignored <laughs> oh yeah That's... maybe oh maybe maybe this is the first person when you actually get your like uh you know when, when you when you get your real divination magics mm. um from vera maybe doralyn is is the one maybe they're maybe they're another member of the uh of the the traveling circus that you're with the traveling entertainers and you want to you want to see this you you want to try it out you don't want to just try it on the, the next random person um and so you you give them a reading and something something that you you tell them where like this is the first time you're like oh my god you, you're you're gonna like when we're traveling next one of the wagons is gonna it's gonna fall off the cliff and 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 your ankle is gonna be caught by one of the ropes and you're gonna go with it it's like uh you need to stay away from ropes and and it's like it's like but you know this person's like okay all right cool yeah thanks like i know how you guys are you know whatever days later you're traveling and a uh you know the wagon wheel on one side falls off the whole wagon tips over they get launched into the air because their uh, ankle gets wrapped with rope mm. they get a broken ankle and guess what they are they're an acrobat they're out of the show for 
you know, for however many, you know, for however many weeks while they heal or until they can get a cleric into the party who knows regeneration. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I was going to say that that guy is part of the Waiting Crescent and that's why they don't like you. Oh, yes. But I, but I do like this, like, the first time it pops and it works, like, yeah, especially it's like an insider who's like, yeah, 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 I know, I know the story. Like that, you, like, you, you get out of here, you're just messing with me. And then it happens yeah. and like, everybody's like, whoa, okay, what's happening? And that's how we like, the secrets out now oh oh my um, god um what is this like uh uh what's that one movie uh, uh a final destination it's oh, a final sure. destination moment mm-hmm. where it's like it's like they drink from the cup of tea the first time and they're it's as their mind is getting like attuned to vera Lane's, uh like like divination almost like network where she is she is passing upon this magic to them and he just like looks over at uh at at, at Dorlin Brandy and is like stay away from ropes cuz there's there's that one scene in um uh in final destination where the kid uh the little kid sees like sees a shadow of like a trophy and there's a bunch of hangers and the shadow looks like man with hooks and the person's like on the phone calling to all the people that are like are calling the person who's next in line and it's like it's like stay away from a man with hooks stay away from a man with hooks and she's in an elevator with a guy who has a bunch of like prosthetic arms where some of them are hooks and it's like that's the moment i want to sell to a player that's mm. the moment where it's like this this uh this fortune teller bumps into them their eyes roll back in their head and all of a sudden they're like you need to stay away from all chests and it's like in the next adventure there's a room full of chests and like every single one of those a mimic mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. oh man yeah this is good yeah because it's just it's it's npc fodder too it's just like insert yeah. insert good character anywhere and interesting things happens um all right so evocative locations um right. so these it's funny i always can caveat this is like this could be the most wild card of any of them but they everything seems to slot together pretty well most of the time uh give me a d6 all right but i will oh, say yes. a, a setting is versatile so like not necessarily a wild card but if like i'm trying to connect this story to somebody else to another player character's story take an important thing from them put it in a setting and like treat it as a backdrop and then throw in somebody mm-hmm. else's thematic monster and now now you got a stew baby uh what, you, what yeah. did you get i'm sorry uh i got a two uh oh. which i think is is the most fitting thing ever the or uh, the oracular spectacular traveling a, yeah good a, oracular spectacular it's actually uh oracular... it's, an, it's an mgmt album from back oh, in the day okay okay <laughs> oracular spectacular a traveling carnival featuring fortune tellers on a sideshow uh nice. gimme yeah asked and answered <laughs> that covered, is... the, covered that pretty well yeah that that is sick and i i i honestly think um what a uh what a really good one to like kind of tweak and play with um would be the sears tower and having this as like a secondary location um of you know letting that be not necessarily the sears tower but the hag's grove Mm. of a of a, of a paranoid divination wizard um still filled with traps where like she has she has the circus has come to her has come to her neck of the woods they are traveling through and they have set up and there's now all these people around and this hag comes out of the woods to see all these people and who's there our character the great gatsbino uh you know who's doing this who is doing this very cheeky kind of kind of fortune telling and she rolls up and she's like i can show you the ways of truly reading the future if you wish to know and it's like and you know it's like "Ah, i don't know i'm pretty good and she's like she's like people will pay quite a gold coin to find out the futures that i can give to your mind and that plays into the motivation of finding a better and faster way to make money uh because if he if in this backstory the the idea is of him leaving this traveling circus and going out and traveling with a group of adventurers this is his way of like spreading her own power spreading Vera's power around and the wider net that he can spread 
and he thinks he's doing good. You know, like I, I think in a lot of ways, this would almost have to be played up where he's he's getting the good visions, like in that first one where it's like it's like, oh, I I envision you. He sees them like laying on a bed and his fam the these family members are surrounding them. And it's like, I I see you days from now. You're you're surrounded by friends and family and loved ones. But it is Vera who is, you know, back at her hut where her mind is going, you know, like seeing the truth of it, of they have passed because they have been killed or they died of sickness or illness. And this is their mourning. This is their their funeral pyre. And it's like she's limiting what, uh, you know, what the great Gatsby, you know, can see. I love that. I literally, I mean, one, you're, yeah, I love you working. That's very, very fun to watch. Um, two, I also love how we took, uh, we've made our asset or ally pretty much the big bad evil. And we were like, no, I like that organization. I'm good. That's not an antagonist. That's going to be our buds. And like, yeah. that's, that's so, that's cool as the author. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, Change cause the anything and everything. Because, and because the reality is here and, and looking at this from a, from a DM perspective, Vera is going to be your character's ally for a while. They're, mm. they're going to be your, they're your patron. So it's, it's going to be until you, your, it's going to be until your character develops those skills after a point, because I'm looking at this character as a divination wizard as I've moved away in my mind from a warlock, mm -hmm. but with like this character, if I was designing them and I was making their, their character sheet, they would be a wizard. They'd be a divination wizard with the Eldritch adept feet. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is the connection to uh, the warlock patron that they have uh, kind of just like having a little bit of influence in their life. Um, where Vera is Vera is giving them, but they are slowly developing their own tools and their own skills and digging into this. Or it could just be a full on warlock, because that also would be really hilarious to have your own patron be your antagonist. And fl flavor is free. Sometimes, it, sometimes it requires yes. effort. And if if a, if a player is asking the DM to make that effort, they're going to have to make a compensatory amount of effort too. But like, I want to play divination wizard, but I'm going to act like it's a warlock who gained their abilities from a hag. Like, I don't see a problem there. Yeah. At all. Like, um, it's funny. There was a couple, there were a couple moments in this conversation where I was like, this is a, this is, um, uh, chro chro chronology, chro chrono, chronologist. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Chrono, uh, chrono, chrono, chrono or whatever. Or like, uh, that's what Calendar is. He's a chronomancer. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, all right, thematic monsters, thematic monsters. Uh, Crystal Serpents plays very heavily into what I'm doing with March. Um, I got Mind Whispers, ethereal creatures that spread chaotic false premonitions for fun. Oh my god, if that isn't just perfect, Mercurial Fray with access to the whatever the ether, oh, <laughs> the ethereal yeah. plane, like, ooh. Oh my god, that would be these the mind whispers are a hundred percent the uh the creatures that are surrounding the hag's grove. That's the conduit. That's the whole that like you you, you all like you 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 gain the ability to see into the ethereal plane at like level four, level five, and it's like here's the source of all of that. Where were all those answers coming from? Yes, this weird little goblin thing that's been sitting right. on your shoulder the whole time. Like, oh my god, yes, just, that makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. He's just sitting there, yeah. It's just sitting there, like like hey. feeding you it, and it's like it's like, hey, you can finally see me. Good. Uh, this will make it a lot simpler. Let's. I don't yeah, know why. He, I don't know why he sounds talk. like that, but yeah. it's just it's just yeah. It's like he's he's got like he's got like one of those old uh, like New York uh, uh -huh. like Derby Boy hat hats on. Uh -huh. He's got a cigar in his mouth in my mind. Yeah. I don't know. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. He's wearing. Uh, he's he's wearing like a really thick leather jacket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like a vest, uh, yeah. though. He doesn't have sleeves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, my um, God. That is that is beautiful. 
D twenty. Uh, you can right. stop. You can stop when you feel finished. And this, this, I don't, I don't feel like anything's missing here. Um, but again, so a lot of the time we talk about this, we're starting from zero. You know, character creation sets in zero. But this is just a, this is a basket of ideas. And sometimes, like we talked about, how important prep is. But sometimes you don't get your couple hours in before it's game time. So you might want to go reaching or. You had tons of stuff prepared and you just had to throw it out the window because they zigged and you were just confident they were going to zag. Yeah. Uh, so what do, we, what do we get for this plot hook or story uh, seed, adventure idea? So I got 12. Mm -hmm. The legendary oracle is the only chance at finding answers, but reaching them is not safe or easy. Uh, a classic. Yeah. Yeah. I This this to me, um, when I saw that and I thought of like Vera Lane being a... Uh, it it it, it kind of made me change who Vera Lane is, and in my mind, our character, our character, it has an unnamed patron right now. It is 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 what I have what I've quickly switched to, is that our character actually has a uh an unnamed uh patron, and Vera Lane is actually the legendary oracle, who is the sister of the hag. In kind of a, kind of like a Wizard of Oz. That's exactly uh, where I went. Good yeah. witch, bad witch vibes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like you have these two diviners. Um, you know, one of them is a corrupt fae, and one of them is like you know like unseely and seely, and mm -hmm. having you know having one of these. And I mean, I still think I I, I still want to go with Vera being the uh, the hag and the one who's giving you your power so she is definitely an asset but like <laughs> having her sister the uh the the glinda the good witch um being this legendary oracle of like how do we how do we defeat her like how how do we stop this because maybe uh maybe these premonitions are starting to uh are are, are starting to like manifest into something uh because looking through these plot hooks the one that uh the one that caught my eye was number four mm -hmm. dark dreams are visiting anyone who drinks from the villages well mm. um and that one that one kind of like in my mind goes back to the bone china teacup mm -hmm. and it being like you know like this this well has run off from the hag who maybe maybe is an oracle in her own right who corrupt creatures go to to find out you know answers and stuff and maybe that is how she reads maybe she reads via via tea leaves but she has she she has allowed her her runoff to go into the water supply and is now imbuing that with with a darkness that is giving the nearby village a uh you know these nightmares and honestly uh you can play that up by making the manifest into shadows and mm. like undead or not undead but like elder tours or these uh these mind uh what do we got mind whispers mind whispers oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. just like oh, little yeah, yeah. like like yeah two-dimensional shadowy versions of them mm -hmm. um I like that a lot, and that would that would make the the glass blowers with some sort of enchantment capability much more potent because it's like if you want to you know if you want this water to be potable and and sleep at night yeah you, you got to talk to us and we'll we'll help you out. I've been I I I went back to this like triptych mother maiden crone you know mm -hmm. hags come in covens you know yes. which is which is come in threes so like the one. Like you have contacted who like took you in and like maybe you're a changeling, right? I don't even care what class Ooh. you are. You want you want a connection to a hag, like they you, they adopted you and replaced yeah. you with a log that they animated into whatever, like <laughs> right? Like yeah. or maybe you're the you're not the changeling, you're the baby they got snatched and replaced yeah. by a changeling. And she's got two sisters, and one of them is the oracle on the top of the mountain, and one of them is the the one who went mad. Cause like an infinite amount of time oh. if you're immortal, given the ability to perceive time in ways that you know mere mortals can't and like and then altering these timelines and navigating all that like one way would be like 
I'm going to get perverse satisfaction out of manipulating people with this. One's like, I've seen too much and I just need to protect myself from all of these horrific possible outcomes. I've watched Final Destination too many times. I can't drive behind a log truck anymore. Yeah. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, and the third one is just like, this is this is too much power or responsibility. Like, I have I've grown weary of telling people, telling these mortals they're going to die. And I'm going to seclude myself at this mountaintop. And she's the only one who knows, you know, yeah. the, the truth of everything. Um, that's a that's a very cool narrative structure to have going that, on in the background of your campaign. That would be that would be sick. Cause yeah, you I mean you could have you could have this adventure. Um, you could you could have an adventure line with this character be built around, um, be built around these uh these mind whispers. You know, people people having this uh these experiences where. <clears throat> they're starting to they're they're starting to have um you know prophecies being being told to them in their ears um you know conjuring up this fear and you know your character who has this you know who has these gifts of divination of of trying to resolve it and yeah playing into um you know finding finding you know the corrupt sister and uh, not being able to not being able to stop her and having to uh you know seek out the sister on the mountain um you know who who has the answers who who knows the truth but is but is burdened by that um that is that is such a sick storyline that's dope i had a flash of like a level 0 like kind of one player funnel of like this village, mm -hmm. this village, your village is being affected by these mind whispers. You're the only one who could see them, and when and you're playing four commoners, and they go find the hag, and the first one tries to kill the hag and wipes wiped out. Yep. And it's just like, how about you? Do you want to? Would you like to bark it? Right? Like whoever yeah. <laughs> survives is now right? like they made oh a deal with God. the devil. Um, yeah, yeah, because that's the thing. It's maybe maybe you make that this this would be a this would be a warlock, but. Uh, it, it's exactly that. There's these mind whispers, and you and a bunch of your your level zero commoners go and uh, you know, try and follow whatever breadcrumbs you can. Uh, I mean, uh, pun intended. I mean, uh, breadcrumbs, ginger breadcrumbs. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you you go back and you find this hag who is who's descending these upon your village, um, mm. and you make a deal with them of, um, of of you will, as long as your village is safe. And as long as she keeps these mind whispers away from your village, you will go out and you will travel the land sp speaking premonitions to folks and sending her their, you know, th their goodness. Because what I mean, what is somebody what is somebody who is who is full of corruption want? Uh, but but, you know, a moment of of good and relief hmm. you know so she feeds upon she feeds upon this because when you have somebody exuding um you know exuding these premonitions she can feast upon you know that you know these mind whispers these mind whispers gain strength from that but for her she wants that goodness she wants what her sister has mm. you know high up on the mountain mm. of of at one time being this this good prophesizer so you are now traveling as a fortune teller who maybe you're starting out you know maybe you're starting out in it, in it you're kind of like faking it um and that is, you know, because it is coming from another source but over time you're learning to master it mm -hmm. you're learning you know the truth about it eventually you learn that she is one of three maybe you find her her sister who you know is is not the corrupt and is not the you know the high and mighty but the one who the one who basically cut themselves off from it and maybe they become an ally of yours um you know as 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 kind of like i imagine i imagine the one in the middle um there's a there's a fairly like I, I've seen it all the time, but there's this YouTube clip uh, where a guy is walking down a street and somebody like taps him on the shoulder 
and or there's a guy standing there and a person walking by taps him on the shoulder and the guy turns just as a truck is coming around the corner and this gate opens up and it's only because that random person tapped him on the shoulder mm. and he turned to look that he missed getting hit by this mm. and mm. it's like I imagine the middle sister of these crone or of these hags being that one who goes through life knowing what's about to happen to the people around her, but does not want to stir the well in the woe. So, but she does like, she does help. Mm -hmm. And it's like in moments where somebody is about to do something wrong, she, you know, flicks a book or, you know, she pushes a book over. So it Rube Goldberg's down to helping them, um, you know, and, and having the sister, the sister at the, you know, uh, at the top of the mountain, being the one who like she has the answers, but has has secluded herself so that nobody, uh, nobody can can gain that that true insight because it, it can break one. Uh, you know, maybe it's a sad truth that like you know knowledge corrupts. You know, like that that old saying like power absolute mm -hmm. power corrupts absolutely, but like you know knowledge uh, seeking seeking this knowledge can corrupt you just as much as uh, as anything else. Yeah, I like this like one of three, but there used to be a fourth, and we don't talk about her. And she's yeah. the, she's the one in the tower who's just like totally gone mad oh. and just like built the built the funhouse dungeon. Mm -hmm. Um, I like so in Pathfinder, if you're yep. a, a witch, which is the warlock, your mm -hmm. power is is uh, channeled through your familiar. Your familiar is essentially your oh. your spell book. Okay, um, um, and in fifth edition. A wizard is probably going to take fine familiar because it's dope both mechanically yep. and thematically so like maybe you maybe you're aware that you have this mind whisperer on your shoulder the whole time because it, oh, yeah. it was part of your original deal and now you are you are gaining the the muscle memory of divining and getting more and more yeah. powerful but it starts with this guy and eventually you don't need this guy um and he's whatever he's that jerk oh. taxi cab driver from scrooge <laughs> or whatever <laughs> or whatever i made him um so like, hey, great Gatsby and all. Yeah, How you doing? Oh, he's not so great. Um, yeah. <laughs> the great all, Gatsby. It's though. all me. Yeah. You would be nothing without me, kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, I would love to be that guy. Two, yeah. the, the player character is going to love to murder that guy eventually when they no longer yes. need him. Yes. And you're fucking with people who under, who can see you, yeah. right? Like, yeah. you better get that ring of... Protection and mind shielding, right? Because like mm -hmm. you get yep. screw make a wisdom safe. Why? You know why? Make yeah, a wisdom you, safe. Like <laughs> right. That would um, and that would be that would be a really fun way to play it because uh it it because yeah, like you said, if you go wizard, you can grab fine familiar, but if you go warlock, you can go pack to the chain. Exactly. And it's and, different and different ways to get to the same. I don't care what your right. class is, we can make it work here. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and that could be a really fun way of of playing it where like in in a moment whenever you finally start to cross that threshold of relying on the corrupt hag and uh you know and and this this familiar in giving you these answers and being the one that's feeding you to creating a new familiar and mm. having them be mm. a, a manifestation of your own divination of you know some kind of being that you yourself have have manifest into the world um in order to in order to be their folly you know that uh that that ghost of yours god i i i am deeply satisfied with this we could do this all day and all I, day. I want to uh, don't get me wrong yeah. um but eventually <laughs> i have oh. to i have to stop recording this beat oh uh, no, i feel that uh, I love yeah. this. Yeah, the great stuff. Always, always, always awesome sitting down with you, hanging out with you. Um, especially when we get to like, yeah, exercise our imaginations together. That, that, yeah. Um, a lot of awesome stuff coming out of Kelf's corner. And uh, check, check your calendar. Check them out on Patreon because uh, that yeah. is where you'll find uh, all of these awesome creations that he's making. You've seen the man at work now. You know what he's yeah. bringing to the table. That's uh that's off the cuff see what happens when he yeah cr cr what crowd <laughs> crowdsources input and actually uh thinks about things for more than zero seconds yeah. um what's what is what's coming up what is what is new and exciting in the world of of lucas um yeah so so over in kelf's corner um we are making 
uh, as I said a little bit ago, uh, this year is, is is a big year for us um, because we are doing Calendar's collection. So uh, last year, Dungeon 23 was supposed to be a really big thing, uh, and I wanted to have this this huge mega dungeon that was designed and crafted by Calendar, the mad chronomancer. Um, and this year, I decided instead, uh, since that fell apart, um, that I was going to do a bunch of homebrew. I was going to do a, a a yearly calendar of content, and it was going to be Calendar's collection. So uh, we've hit two months so far. January was Frostfell Adventures. It was everything winter and cold. Um, the, uh, we have a really sick ranger subclass, um, that is all about reducing enemies speed, uh, and increasing your own, hmm. um, really cool spells, some magic items, uh, a Yeti kin race an Arctic Explorer background and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and we just finished up February. February is going to be going up on the Patreon, uh, here in about a day or so. Um, it is the Court of Love and Valor, where romance meets chivalry in a dance of destiny. Uh, we we got a really cool paladin subclass called the Oath of Chivalry, which is all about um, a lore and being a gallant knight who goes onto the battlefield and commands the enemies to face them and fight them so that those that are weaker than you um, can be saved from the conflict. Um, and we got a really cool race called the Sunetians. Who are uh, who were created by the goddess Sune to uh, be emotionally driven race that is able to uh, that's able to connect with people on much deeper levels than than any other, hmm. uh, and so just awesome awesome spells, awesome uh, awesome feats and magic items. We got a really cool monster uh, for uh, for February called the Envy Serpent, um, which I'm gonna be featuring on my D and chill stream tomorrow um which is a very cool monster that has an ability called the jealous hiss where it is able to uh it, it is able to make creatures if they fail a wisdom save go after the most valuable thing that someone else has so you know, imagine, imagine being in a conflict and fighting this thing when all of a sudden you hear this hiss that resonates through the area, you take some psychic damage, and all of a sudden you look over at your friend, this barbarian that has been traveling with you for ages, and you see their gilded axe, and your mind goes, that needs to be mine. Mm. And you go for it, and you, you, you try and take it from your companions because you are driven by jealousy. Um, this is what we're going to be working on. And, uh, like we said, uh, at the beginning of this March, March is a big one. Uh, cause when this video comes out, March will be just finishing up and the whims of luck and fate, uh, navigating the capricious tides of fate and fortune. We're going to have a fortune teller, a luck based cleric, um, a leprechaun race, uh, which I, I hope works out because I have some I have some notes for that. And who knows what kind of magic items and spells. So yeah, all kinds of cool stuff this year. Um, and we'll see what uh, the rest of the year has to offer for us because I plan on keeping up with this one as long as I can. Yeah, don't play. I, we all had, I mean, unless we were lying to ourselves, most of us went into Dungeon 23 realizing that we were going to make a dope <laughs> dungeon that was probably not going to have 365 rooms in yeah, it. Yeah, no. Most yeah. of us fell off immediately because the OGL. The OGL, because of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's derailed a lot. Of, I had big plans last year, baby, and they all went right out the freaking window <laughs> first thing, man. Yeah. January wasn't over before the house was on fire last year. No. Which is part yeah. for the course this. That's that's the world we live in now, baby. Yeah. So here's to. Oh man. Here's I'll tell you on the vertigree table, which is I'll tell you what. I, I will tell you what though. Um. Uh. There there was the silver lining to the OGL, which obviously you know, aside from us getting everything put into Creative Commons and you know we the won. OGL being stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. Uh. The one benefit was that it allowed me to meet a bunch of new people and uh find new channels because much like your own i found your channel during the ogl when you were reporting on it so uh definitely had some silver linings out of that um it 
made me one value interactions like this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, YouTubing can be a very lonely business. You sit in a room and talk to nobody. Even if you have chat, it's not quite the same. You don't have coworkers. Yep. <laughs> you know, you don't have, you're, you're, you're screaming into the void half of the time. And um, when you need community is when you find community. And that was a, that was a scary time for, you know, scarier time for others. Uh, yeah. But well, I don't know. We we're, in whatever way, our hobby, our passion, our creativity, and like, you know, we both have some financial interest involved in it. Like, uh, that was all threatened to be taken away from us, and we won. Yeah. And I think that's the that's the headline that gets buried because yep, of you know, rage bait gets clicks and celebratory stuff does not. But we won, and I think this Very like much. this diaspora that's happened, all these new systems that are rising up from it. Everybody's mm -hmm. like cracking open to like divert from 5e there's the benefits of this are are vast and underestimated yes. and we're not we're not even at the peak of feeling them yet dnd is going to be better and healthier yep. and dnd is not fifth edition or 5.5 or what a dnd right. is the ttrpg community i know that feels bad to people in the ttrpg community but if you're not inside of it you mm -hmm. unless you've played dungeons and dragons for a couple of years you don't know what ttrpg means so yeah, yeah. Be, no, I be open to code switching a little bit, folks. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that. You know, it was it was one of those things. The OGL definitely made me realize that, like, like the 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 quote unquote Dungeons and Dragons can be owned by Wizards of the Coast, but you know, Five E, the 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 stories that we tell and and everything that coincides with them will always belong to the community because that's mm -hmm. not something that they can take. You know, in my in my humble opinion, I believe that the it is the homebrew community. It's the it's it's the third party community that is the driving force of what tabletop RPG can be because wizards can only put out so much and wizards has showcased time and time again that they're uh willing to skimp on quality to try and force things out um and you know when when you have a company like that where they're relying on shareholders yeah they don't really care much if you know if a product doesn't do well because they can just lay off a bunch of people but when you have somebody like you know yourself who's out here making quality content you have uh homebrew artists out there that are putting out million dollar kickstarters they are wholly reliant on the quality of the product that they're putting out to one drive attention to the projects that they're working on and two to uh you know once they execute on that to continue that to mm -hmm. allow themselves to keep going at it so mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's such a community effort with with everything that's going on and that's the beautiful thing about it is that uh it's a lot of people think about think about tabletop rpgs and it's like oh you're a basement dwelling you know dice rolling uh kind of goblin thing and it's like no like we are a huge community that banded together and uh showed a million billion dollar company that we won't get pushed around that got frontline you know uh primetime news coverage and uh you know it, it showcases what we can do when we come together because hey we're adventurers that's what mm -hmm. we do we we band together we draw our swords and we go and fight dragons that are uh hoarding all the gold they forgot who they were messing with that's right. Hey, man, you sell me a 300 page dense book of rules every quarter. Yeah. Yeah. Once, did you once forget? A, did you forget yeah. who you were dealing with? <laughs> yeah. Right. Once once every once every 10 years, you sell me a couple books, whereas uh, whereas we we fill out the rest of that uh, that decade. Yeah. If you don't know oh. what the OGL fiasco was, good for you. Uh, yes. <laughs> we'll yes. see you next time. Oh, <laughs> ignorance is bliss. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for this. This was this was a joy. Um, appreciate you very much. Go check. Go support third party publishers like myself. Thank you for mentioning that. But my buddy Lucas here, um, and the too many to name. Some of which are going to be in the description because Lucas did name them. Um, yeah. All right, man. Thank you very much, everybody out there. Be kind, have fun, and yeah, we'll see you next time at the Vertigree Table for D twenty questions. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.